You're good to go. Thanks. I want to welcome everybody to the Manhattan Community Board One Transportation and Street Activity Permit Committee for June of 2023. I'm Betty Kay, the chair of the committee. I'm joined by Jess Coleman, who's the co-chair. And from the office, we have Onez James, who is giving us all of our support. And when you deal with anything where you sent in a message, uh, she's the person who's going to receive it. No one else. It won't go to the general public. So just so you know who you're communicating with. And since we have some people leaving, so we need to be on a tight time frame here. Let's get started with our first item. We have potentially three. We do have three resolutions to work on. So let's get through all of them as quickly as possible before some of our forum has to leave. And so I'm going to start with the people from, if you go to the first sign, from B Bank of New York Mellon, who have requested a revocable consent at 240 Greenwich Street. And I wasn't given the name of who is going to take the leadership. So if you would identify yourself, you can just unmute yourself and introduce yourself and your team. Hi, Betty. My name is Aravella Simotis. I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to present on uh, on this on this question. And um, I work, I do government affairs for Bank of New York Mellon. I have a team with me and I just want to introduce them. From BNY Mellon, I have Lula Desma, Liz Muscat, Nicholas Cody, and Tanya Samir. From Astantec, our engineers, we have Katie uh, Havener and Gloria Lau. And from Structure Tone, our construction professionals, I have we have Stacey Daxon and Timothy Heaney. And I'm gonna hand it over to Katie, who's going to do a presentation on our uh, on our revocable, revocable consent request. Thank you, Sarah Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. I'm going to share my screen and please let me know if you guys can see this. <clears throat> can you guys see my screen okay? Yes, yes. Katie. Okay, great. Are you seeing the full size or are you seeing it in blue beam? Full size. Full size. Great. Okay. Awesome. Well, yeah. So good evening, everyone. Um, as Arabella mentioned, my name is Katie Havener. I'm a civil engineer and um, project manager for the security improvements project at 240 Greenwich Street or the Bank of New York Mellon. So just to orient everyone to the project location, the site is located in lower Manhattan. Um, just east of Battery Park City and north of the 9-11 Memorial. The existing streetscape around the, the building is predominantly concrete sidewalk with above grade planters and trees. Um, the plaza on the corner of West Street or Route 9A and Murray Street has a grade differential with hardscape pavers. Um, so the next few slides, we'll, we'll just, I'll show some photos of the existing conditions around the building so you can kind of better comprehend um, you know, what we're looking at. So the key map in the lower right corner can be used to orient the angle of these photos, but photo one is a view looking west along Barclay Street. The above grade planters are shown on the right. And then photo two is taken at the corner of Barclay and Greenwich Street looking north. And the bank's main entrance is just um, on the left side of this photo. Um, kind of midway through um, down the block. In photo three um, from Murray Street, it's looking west down the street. And then photo four is actually taken at the plaza that I mentioned earlier, looking west again towards Route 9A. And as you can see with these few photos um, from these ex existing conditions, there's minimal security infrastructure protection around the building or around this public plaza. So a goal of this project is to provide the necessary protection for both pedestrians and the Bank of New York Mellon. This next slide shows the overall master plan for this project. So while there's ample streetscape improvements with planters and seating, as you can see in, in green, um, today's focus will be just on the security infrastructure in the form of bollards. The bollards will be placed along the curb line shown with that yellow highlight to form a secure perimeter around the building, as well as around a secure perimeter around the plaza. And these bollards will have typical five foot on center spacing and allow ADA access at all of the pedestrian ramps around the, the property. So the next couple of slides will showcase renderings of the project and we'll start 
um, with the plaza. So this first rendering shows kind of a bird's eye view of the plaza with a secure perimeter um, shown, as well as the building secure perimeter tying back into the service driveway that you can kind of see on the left side of this rendering. And then along Murray Street, the second rendering uh, shows the typical placement of bollards at the curb line to the right. And this is what forms that secure building perimeter. Taking a closer look at the bollard design itself, I just want to pause here. You know, there's there's a technical detail shown, there's a, a rendering shown, as well as like a product um, image shown. So there, the bollard's design criteria complies with the NYPD requirements as outlined in their um, protective design for high risk buildings manual. So these bollards are rated to protect pedestrians and building assets from mid-sized trucks traveling between 30 and 50 miles per hour. They'll stand about three feet high and be placed typically five feet on center with the 12 inch diameter stainless steel cover. And that's to complement that existing building facade. And that stainless steel cover you can see in the middle of this, of this slide here. There, um, the shallow foundation, as you can see in the kind of the black and white detail, um, these shallow foundations were designed to not conflict with existing utility infrastructure below the sidewalk all around the building. And then finally, the project will be split up into multiple phases starting in August of this year. The approximate phasing will start with Barclay Street, then Murray Street, the plaza, and end with Greenwich Street. Um, pedestrian access around the block will be maintained while also accommodating existing entrances, egress routes, service driveway functions. And you can see here, there's a lot of colors, a lot of dates, but um, we tried to kind of graphically show the, the approximate phasing and the approximate timeline of each of these um, construction uh, phasing zones. So I know I went through that maybe pretty quickly, but um, just kind of want to give uh, yeah, that, that run through. So are there any questions or I'm happy to open the, give the floor back over to Arvella if you'd like to add on to anything. No, we're just here to answer any questions that the board might have. Um, if you're, if you're, if any questions that you may have about why we are doing this project um, after, for those of you who don't know, after 9-11, we were told as a globally systemic important bank that we needed to have our our facilities secured and we've worked uh, closely with the NYPD Office of Counterterrorism to figure out a, a plan and a solution to protecting our building. Um, but it, it was a requirement that we had to do this. Yes, thank you for that. And in fact, it, it I can tell you that was cleared with the DOT. This has gone through uh, the police counterterrorism and they, they are correct. About that, uh, there was a resolution back in 2021, January, I believe, about this same project. They should, unfortunately, they should not have commented about right of way because that's the purview of this committee, but they did. So since they did, we somewhat, I somewhat have to address that in my resolution. Excuse me, I'm going back to get the exact wording. Um, in January of 2021, uh, the Land Use Committee, they had a resolution, CB1 strongly opposed the addition of numerous bollards planned for the periphery of the site located in the public right of way. Uh, Design security measure, they asked for design of security measures that could be achieved through plantings and other landscape elements to create a secure area within their property line. Uh, I can tell you that I'm a very disappointed by this. I pulled this off the website. So this is the official copy of the resolution. But I know that I specifically asked to include, unless this was for security reasons, for some reason that got lost along the way because it was accepted at full board. Anyway, we'll work with what we have. So I hear what people have to say. And I want to start with, like as always, we'll start with committee members first. And Justine, yes, you should be moved to full to uh although you're not a committee member, you should certainly be a panelist. 
So I'll start with Eric Yu, and then we'll go to Brandon Thompson, who is a new member. I've I've worked in the financial district a little bit before 9/11, and I, I understand the need to protect the building, but this seems like you're it's taking over the entire block. These bollards, um, you're moving it beyond the building property line and you're taking up public space um i i don't it's just it seems overwhelming that that it's, it's almost as if you're moving the building's property line out into the street and then also you're you're losing parking spots um you're t you're reducing the parking available and there i hope there's another way to do this besides moving these bollards to the curb is there another way I mean, is, is it technically required to, to have it so far from the building? Just, uh, <clears throat> I think I can answer part of that. Am I on mute? No. Okay, if you need to hear it. Um, the, only, uh, the only thing is that the uh, the line of the curb, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not answering the question about uh, the bollards, but the line of the curb is actually set up by uh, DDC. We are not choosing the outline of the curb. <clears throat> The curb is being pushed out by DDC in a separate project through the city um, to the line of where you see it there. Yes, and the public right of way that the DOT owns is around the curb line. And if if you want to be honest about it, the block that is due west, because I live just west of this, the block due west of them is Goldman Sachs and they have bollards around them. Next to across the street from them to the south is Brookfield Place. They have bollards around the street sign around the whole building for a couple of blocks. And if you go two blocks south of them to the Port Authority a security zone, they have bollards around the whole area. So this is not out of place for the location at all. In fact, I asked people who were visiting me from out of town and they said, what bollards? They didn't even notice them. Mm -hmm. If I could also add to that, um, by placing the bollards at the curb line, it's not only protecting the building assets, but it's also protecting the pedestrians that are, you know, walking within the right of way on the sidewalk. I think that's that's one of the goals of the NYPD is not only protect the buildings, but also pedestrians. So then whose idea or proposal was it to take the parking spots on Greenwich Street? DDC. Although, if you look at the picture, you'll see they've turned the angle of the parking spaces. So people actually pull in head nose to the mm -hmm. curb. Right, so they're angled. Like they're the more space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're not parking along the curb line. But in the other sketch, there was a, there was a line a, across the, where it showed that there's no, those parking spots would be eliminated. Is, yeah, no, but that's, um, that's the old system that it is now. But if you look at the new one and look at the lines where the parking is. Okay, so if this is existing. Who has access to it could show just show where the parking is. Okay, so this is existing, right? Yep. So this is okay. existing. The mm -hmm. curb bump outs that we see in this proposed plan, that's actually part okay. of the DDC capital improvements project. That's okay. all along Greenwich Street from Barclay, I believe, up to Chambers. What was that other sketch? Not not the one that was pretty. The, the one that you after your presentation. Um, I think it's this one. The construction dates. Dates. Yeah. Okay. So what what is this? Oh, these are just the phases. They're just phasing. dates. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Which raises a question you didn't bring up: What's going to happen to the pedestrians and cyclists during construction? What protections are being taken or routing for them? Well, as, um, as we go through the phases, we'll be yes. creating um, along the street line. I guess if you look at the, uh, the north part, Murray Street, um, currently we would step out into the uh, street and work with the DOT in those smaller phases to do, um, what are those? Uh, Tim, you, you know the name for the docks, Yo docks, um, to, cool. create a, to create a uh, pedestrian walkway um off of the sidewalk uh, depending on how the phase uh, gets implemented across the sidewalk that's correct Lou. 
And you're going to have access for people who can't do curbs like me? Yes. Okay, because right now it's it's a mess, which isn't your fault because you're not working on it. But people are just having to make their way through traffic to figure out what to do. So I'm hoping it's going to get better than that. We well, are going accessible. We'll be working as hard as we can, you know, to make it as accessible as possible for people going through the space, especially maintaining all of the emergency exits from the building and uh, you know ADA access across the site and as fast as possible. And, well, and what's going to happen to the city bike dock? Because obviously it has to move while you're working on that stretch of Murray Street. We're we're in discussions with them. I'm not sure where they will move it in its final location. Right now, they just asked us to notify them uh, a few weeks beforehand so that they could relocate it. Okay, thank you. And let Brendan Thomas speak. Thompson. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so you answered one of my questions, or at least approached one of my questions, which was, what's going to happen to the city by starts? I'm going to just rattle through some questions. Um, let me know if you need me to ask them again. Um, but will you need to tear up the sidewalks to install these bollocks? Um, as we know, there's a lot of construction going on right now in Greenwich anyway. Um, and so then to add additional construction for adding these on during a similar period, I think would be a hindrance. Um, right now, and I don't mind them, but there are food trucks right uh, on Greenwich as well. What are gonna happen to those? Um, I guess what I'm really getting at is, are we pushing pedestrians into a silo or off of the sidewalk while we have this happen? And it looks like this is at for at least a year, but we all know construction, especially in New York, that means longer. And even if it's in phases. And so I'm just thinking of, I walk that, that block regularly and it's bad enough as is, are we just about to make this worse? I think um, as as we set up these phases, so the red section would happen only by itself. The yellow section will only happen by itself. Purple, you know, as we move through, we'll be doing each of these individually. Um, I think the way that we plan this, the green section, which is on Greenwich Street currently, is to totally torn up and a mess going up north. But uh, the reason we put that section last is that we're working actually the purple area and the uh, and the green area. We're waiting for DDC to get off of the street so that we, you know, it's a little so there's less going on and we'll be doing, you know, an inner and outer phase so that we will allow people to walk up and down uh, that area without having you know to interfere with the street. And to allow for space for pedestrians is the thought or decision to add similar walkways that are similar to what's on West Street right now while you all are doing construction? Because that's already pretty tight. And if we do that around the entire building, it's a it's a bad experience. Well, it'll only, as I said, it'll only be happening in sections like the red section. We would be creating a pedestrian walkway down that red section. Nothing else will be happening around the rest of the building except for the, if there is any, you know, the DDC moving their way north. And then when the yellow area starts, we'll create, you know, a pedestrian walkway around that area and the red section will be open to the regular sidewalk at that point. And nothing else will be being done. You know, it's going to step around the building as, um, as gracefully as possible. And what about tearing up the sidewalks? Does that need to happen? So are the sidewalks just gonna be junk while these are being installed? Yes, the entire sidewalk will come up and then the uh, will be concreted over and planter, you know, the planters installed before we move on to the next section. And what about the food trucks that are there? Uh, the food trucks will be accommodated. Uh, I mean, they're only on Greenwich Street right now, and they're coming in and out, you know, with the, uh, I don't know if there are any other food trucks on the side streets, um, but uh, they'll be accommodated as best as we can um, as work is going on. So my concern is not as much around the food trucks being accommodated, but around them actually being pushed more into the pedestrian walking area. 
while construction is happening, which again will lessen the uh, area for pedestrians to walk. Has there been any discussion around there? And there is at least a breakfast cart on Murray. So another consideration. So have you all talked to them or talked to with anybody or figured out a solution for that? Or are they just going to come and take over the whole sidewalk and then I have to navigate food trucks where I should be just walking? Well, I would tend to think if, if it's a walkway, there has to be a minimum dimension for the walkway. So they can't obstruct, um, can't obstruct that. Uh, from a standpoint of movement, I mean, they're permitted. I guess they move where they can. Um, but I think during the construction on Greenwich Street, uh, Tim, I don't, I don't believe that they would be. Well, they definitely wouldn't be pushed in closer to the building. I guess they may have to move across the street or around the block, depending on how that works. We'll have to coordinate with them. We, we actually yeah, Mr. Thompson. Don't control the food trucks. They set up where they find it's profitable, so they just wherever they can set up. So if there's construction, they'll likely move somewhere else, but we don't, we don't have any kind of contract with them or control over where they, they actually go. No, I understand that, but I think it's still something to take in consideration. Last question and last bit I want to kind of double click on. Um, it was alluded to before, but you are working with city bike, supposedly. Mm -hmm. Can you yes. talk more about that or like. I, like we know city bike uh, stock stations end up on sidewalks all the time. So my fear again is lessening the pedestrian walkway by moving those docks just on sidewalks. So can we get commitment that that's not going to happen? Um, especially during this almost probably to your face. Um, I, I've, I've spoken with city bikes and what they do. We've actually asked them to. Try to help coordinate and they basically work with the DOT. And they'll move the bikes to where there's space available based on requirements and where the use is. And we really, as much as we try to put input on that, they they just do what works best for DOT and city bikes. So they'll move it. It's we don't own that land. It's on the city, the DOT property. And what they do is they just move it for the construction and they can bring it back if they want. We don't even know if they'll bring it back. It's really their choice when they move the bike stand. We we would like to have more control over that, but we don't. Okay, thank you. I can validate that the COT this the DOT has complete control over what lift can or cannot do with city bikes. Uh, in the past, that city bike dock was actually in an area that's now a construction area. It was a DOT that wanted it in the street. So I see no reason that they're going to want it in the sidewalk when in the past they have not done that. The question where they're going to move it, they move, may move it just as these zones are moving around, they may move it in accordance with that. It's going to depend on lifts resources or being able to keep moving things over and over again, what the DOT can work out, but we'll take that on later. But she's right, they would have really no say in that matter. As much as they'd like it, they're not going to. Uh, a question, will there be a phone number where people could make a call in real time and get an answer if there is a complaint or a problem, such as someone setting up a food truck and blocking the pedestrian way or something else occurring in real time that is a problem? Is there some kind of manager? Because the other construction management areas have had a number where a contact could be made and publicized. That's a that's a great question. I um, I was going to leave it to Tanya to answer, but we'll um, I guess we'll double back with Aravella and Tanya and see what we can set up. I mean, we did talk about making it. Uh, we would like to have communication open and assure the committee here that we're you know open to listen to and see what happens during construction. So if there are problems, we definitely want to hear about them. Yes, Betty. Um, I um, I talked to uh, I talked to Lucian uh, about the project. I've talked to him a few times. So certainly he he 
the community board could get to me, whether I can I can answer something in real time. I don't think that's practical for me, but if you know if you hear complaints and the community board comes back to me, I'll certainly try to address them. Okay, if there could be some sort of direct contact to be measured out, especially given that Lucian will be leaving very soon and the mm -hmm. office staff will be very shorthanded. Uh, and in other projects, as I said, we've kind of kept the office out of it. They're in the loop, but they're not solely responsible for acting between the two sets of parties, the complainant and uh, the management team that can do something about solving the problem. Well, I'll certainly talk internally with our team and figure out what solution we can provide for that. Please, because I think that'll be a critical factor. So let me go to Pat Moore, because usually she deals with these as head of quality of life. It's just it's all the DDC. Say. So I'm going to let her take over, and this is what she does all the time. Yeah, Betty, I was going to ask why is why is the, why are they presenting at this committee instead of in quality of life since it's construction? Because right of way, which is DOT, and we always take those. Okay, because I think they, I thought they were supposed to come back to no. quality of life. Okay, no. so since you're not going to come to quality of life, and yeah, we deal with construction all the time, that was a major question, is we need a number in real time. We ask all construction projects. First of all, do you have some sort of community liaison who's working with residents who live in <sighs> close proximity to this project? I am not certain if there is a community liaison. I I only I only joined the bank um, after this project was presented to you, but I certainly can could find out. I I don't believe that there is one right now, but okay. I will talk to my team in order to to. Because we really need that. The people that live mm -hmm. across the street and people that mm -hmm. live on the next block. So, I cannot read it because it's too small. Is this a two year project? Am I did I hear that correctly? We are just getting ready to start in the um, third quarter of this year. Well, actually in August, I believe, um, and it will be finishing up. It's I think it's about a year. I think it ends or we have it scheduled to end somewhere in September of 2024. Start in August of 2023 and end in September 2024 or. That's boring bad weather and delays. Correct. Um, Okay, so, you know, there's obviously going to be a lot of jackhammering to install these ballards. Am I correct? Mm, that will be during the day where it's like it is right it has now. to be during the day. If not, yes, I know it's it not isn't. going to happen at night. <laughs> exactly. So you again, have you reached out to the people who live across the street and down the street and told them that this project when it will begin, how much noise? what time of day you'll be working and who they can contact if you're working outside of the hours or if they see some hazardous working condition. This is why we normally have a community liaison with any projects that are taking place. We have not done that yet. This project has been delayed. It was supposed to start um, and you correct me if I'm wrong. There's been just some delays because of all the other construction. So we, we, we were supposed to have started this project around the time I joined the bank and right. uh, we're still, we're, it's, it's been delayed, but I, I certainly, you know, if you can provide me with the information of who to reach out to, I certainly will do that myself. To let the, to select I'm not the understanding community. though. I mean, what do you mean? Who to reach out to? In other words, if you have if you have a basis of community residents or people or groups, I certainly will reach out to them to let. No, them that's know. why it's up to the community liaison okay. to go out and make that list to knock on those doors to put posters up to tell people stop people on the street and hand them flyers and tell them a project is about to begin. How long it will take who they can contact if there is a problem. So I would ask that you get back to us as soon as possible. With that information and and I would hope that you will appoint someone to that position. Who is who will be taking phone calls in real time as Betty said, as we always ask in real time at that moment, not I call you. There's a problem and you don't get back to me for 3 days, not you, but whomever doesn't get back to me for 3 days. You want them to get back to us immediately. All right. Yes, because there are residences certainly on Murray Street and the Brooklyn, the borough of Manhattan community college is across the street from you on Greenwich Street. In Barclay. Well, yeah, and they're on Barclay. And there's residential housing, so. Exactly. So that is a big, big ask that we have. Is that you? Is Tammy there? Yes. 
Tis I, Pat. Tis you. So that is that is something we ask of every project. So you're not unusual. We're not asking of something something of you that we don't ask everyone to supply us with. So please get back to us as soon as possible because again, it's jackhammering. You know, we hope you're not going to start before. I know you're legally allowed to start, but we always ask. You're legally allowed to start. I think at eight o'clock. We always ask that you start with the quietest tasks first, and then you jackhammer, say, after nine when people are up. The other thing that we ask is that you speak to your construction workers to tell them that it isn't only jackhammering that disturbs residents, but if somebody is outside at, you know, 7, 30, 8 o'clock yelling, hey, Joe, I need a hammer, that is just as disturbing as you know, it's seven or eight o'clock in the morning as the jackhammering is going to be later on during the day. So those, those, I'm, I'm sure I'll have other things to say, but that's our main thing is that we feel like you need a community person that we can contact and who will contact and work with the residents that live in close proximity and the businesses that are in close proximity. Thank you. Thank you. Betty, did we lose you there? All right, no. Uh, Justine, why don't you go? And then Tammy, Eric, since you're second time around, you'll go after other people have spoken once. Thanks. Thanks. And and Anaj, I'm sorry that I bumped off and bumped on and made you jump through hoops. But um, all right. My question is looking at this picture that's up there now. Um, on this on Greenwich Street, um, in the green area. Betty, will you say, and I'm, I may have misunderstood you, but in the green area, are you saying that the parking is going to be switched from uh, what I would call like uh, K parking to pull in and pull out parking with those little arrows? Is that, you know, not arrows, those, those little lanes that are there? Katie, would you say, is that what's happening? Is there changing the flow of, of parking spots? Is that what's going on there or no? Um, there was already parking there. Let me flip back. Yeah, if you look at the diagram, they're yep, they're perpendicular. Right, I see perpendicular. But in, when I the reason why I'm asking the question is because this is in an older picture. I was seeing, and I thought that they were saying when Eric was talking, it looked like it had the same. Uh, it was an old design. It did look like it had the same. But Same it's way, different. Yeah. So the idea is this is mm -hmm. going to be perpendicular where people are pulling in. So technically, where it says the words Greenwich Street, you'd have mm -hmm. one, two, three, Looks four, like five, six, seven, eight, whatever, and counting 10, 12 spaces. Is that a true mm -hmm. statement or is that not? We have no idea how many spaces are out there. That's by the DDC. So this is or DOT. DOT. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to you, though, is, is that in this picture, this is before, correct? Yep, correct. There is correct. not perpendicular port parking there right now, but looking at this, correct. looking at this diagram, it looks like there might be. There is perpendicular parking there now. Oh, there is. Okay, thank you. There thank is. You, Tammy. So then it did, did then in the new picture with the curb bump outs, it would be less parking because it has to be because you're cutting into the space, but it still will be perpendicular parking, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay, sorry. I just wanted to have clarification. I was very confused. I guess you could tell I don't drive there. <laughs> All right, thank you. Also looks like they're changing the direction of the street. Wait, what does that mean? Um, How do you one mean way. Greenwich? Yeah, no, Greenwich? I'm just saying is it I'm based on this picture. It looks like people would be driving north, but I know that they currently drive south. Uh, not according to the diagram. If you take a look at the bottom, the turn signal oh, is to the right. I wonder how do you, uh, I don't know, it looks interesting. They just look interesting. The lines must be, um, I would think they'd want to be the other way, but that's depends on how they paint the lines. Hmm. Who gave you that diagram? That would. This, yeah, this diagram is, is generated yeah. off of survey, off of um, files we received from, from DDC, Google Maps. Yeah, so these this striping is, is really diagrammatic 
purposes. You know, this may not be exact, but um, yeah, this is generally what what the DDC is proposing. If I understand correctly, so the parking spaces are like that because you were actually required to back into those spots, so they were not pulled. Okay. Who knows if that'll change or not? But mm -hmm. that makes sense now, at least to me, because then you can take off in the right direction. Okay, thank you. If Tammy, if you'd like to speak. Yep. So uh, there was a question in the public session by Kelly, and I'd like to reiterate that because I've asked this before. Um, there are planters that are staying, and when this project first came to the community board, the request by the community at the time was to find a way to use planters instead of bollards for surrounding the property, as is done in Midtown and many other places. And I would love to understand why if planters are going to be remaining and other things, there is a large toolkit that um, is under security that has nothing, that has alternative options to just ugly bollards that make, quite frankly, it feel like you're putting the building behind bars and prisons. So it's not what I would call fantastic in the public realm having bollards everywhere it's not user friendly it's not beautiful in any stroke of the imagination and if you've got planters can you um explain why the planters and there was no way to have them be sufficient for security with built arounds if i may tammy um you know i i could tell you i understand what you're saying as a former a uh, community board member myself, I completely understand about beautifying our neighborhoods and making sure that construction uh, is in line to what we envision for our neighborhoods. I completely understand, um, but you know there there are there are certain requirements uh, for as I mentioned, we're a globally systemic bank. We we have responsibilities to the United States Treasury. There there are requirements of the kind of security measures we have to erect. And working with the NYPD Office of Counterterrorism, you know, we, we didn't have that many options. We worked with them and they they gave us they gave us options and we chose what we thought would be the best option. Now I wasn't involved in that, so I don't know all of the specifics, but um but I know I know that we tried very hard to make sure that these um that these uh, bollards blend in and don't obstruct I as much as possible. And Aravel, if I if I could elaborate on that as well. So, to your point, you know, there there were analyses performed, um, vehicular vector analyses performed to understand what type of rating would be required of these bollards. Without getting in, into too too much level of detail, there's three different ratings of crash crash rated bollards. This building did require the highest rating due to kind of the geometry of, of the surrounding roadways and, and how much speed a, a vehicle could gain and, and impact this, this perimeter. Um, so we not only had to comply with the highest tier um, crash rating, um, but there's also requirements for the bollard heights for clear distance between them. Um, if planters were to be used, oftentimes they, they end up having to be become like walls. You know, so if we have to achieve a three foot minimum height, it, now, you, now you're creating a planter wall um, that actually oftentimes can be sometimes be more restrictive than than what these 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 bollards are um, are actually providing. I think there's more free flow with these bollards than there would be with with a K-rated wall. Um, Kate, I appreciate what you're telling me. It's just very disappointing and frustrating that it's truly. Um, we were told by counterterrorism that there are opportunities and different types of things because we've had these discussions before, but certainly the way the bollards are presented here is efficient. Um, in some ways, less costly to maintain and all the beautification is put real estate value wise up against the building. And I don't see anything in here that you've shown us necessarily that uh, goes towards resiliency measures. I mean, I didn't hear the words bio swells and anything that are around. I didn't hear anything that was anything that I would say had resilient features more than just green being added, um, which there would have been opportunities if we were looking at opportunities that didn't weren't necessarily just a ring of bollards. 
So unless I've missed something in the presentation, can you uh, tell me if there was anything for resiliency that was added? So in terms of resiliency, I mean, the, the plantings that are to be added around the perimeter of the building, we are going from 100% hardscape to, to reducing that hardscape to now adding all these planters. Um, so one would maybe suggest that that is a step towards resiliency, introducing more green space Okay, um, thank you. It was one of the questions I was asked to double check with you and um, I thought there were more entrances to DC 37 than you show here. I'm a little confused um, only because my understanding that there was more than one entrance to DC 37, but you're only showing one on Murray Street and are you shrinking based on the design that you have there the you know, I missed that part of the presentation for obviously we understood from DOT that the bike rack was going back there. So where in your designs would the bike rack be going or what part of your design in that area is flexible so the bike rack can return the city bike racks. And, do, and it also looks like it's shrinking in size. Please correct me if I'm wrong on that, because that is a pops. So I, I can speak to to the size of the plaza. Um, as you can see here, we you know we don't I don't have an enlargement in this presentation, but we are providing, you know, the the perimeter of those planters are all seat walls, We're providing move, you know tables and chairs, um, while the hardscape of the plaza will be reduced because we're adding plantings and we're adding more pervious area. Um, the plaza square footage itself is is not shrinking. It's just it's opening more opportunity for plantings and trees and such. So I hope that answers that question. In terms of DC 37's entrance, we have shown here there one entrance that um, goes through the plaza. There is another entrance, from my understanding, on Barclay Street that we don't have um, shown diagrammatically here, just because it, we were not um, directly adjacent to it or impacting it. Um, I, I assume maybe Arabella or Tanya, if you want to speak to City Bike. Um, I, I, I can speak to City Bike. So previously, initially, the City Bikes were on the BNYM property. And that's when they were moved off of BNYM property, which was, I think, in the last I think six months or something. Uh, and now they're on Murray Street. So that's DOT property, no longer on our property. And we no longer have a contract with City Bikes. So wherever they go, will be outside of our discretion or control. Uh, I have tried, I'm a city bike user as well, and I love city bikes and I've tried, you know, I did try in the process to say, hey, can you move it around back? You know, people want to use it or, you know, where are you going to put it? Just, and I, I didn't get anywhere with that. So the DOT will decide where they relocate the bikes or if they're going to move them, you know, somewhere temporarily and keep them there or bring them back. We don't know the answer. But previously, they were on our property and they are no longer on our property. So it's outside of our control. That doesn't answer my question, though. We were told that if it was made available, DOT would return to that location in that pop space because it was a well utilized and well valued um, location. So what I asked was within the designs that you have, what opportunities for change do you have? to allow the city bike to return into that pops, into that by near somewhere in that facility. Yep. And, and, and how does what you've done impact the loading dock that uh, DC 37 has on Murray Street? Is that that white spot you have? Okay, thanks for the clarification. Um, I'm not involved on the design itself. So uh, I'll let somebody from the technical team discuss uh, and respond. So the to a it was not um, coordinated to accommodate the city bikes within the plaza space, um, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't be coordinated maybe in the future or discussed. But at this time, it was not part of the design to to count on having city bike back in this plaza area. All right, and I think this the plaza area was was requested to be <clears throat> made uh, a public. It's a public accessible privately uh, as a public accessible area 
Um, I think the idea of what the the plaza was supposed to be was to maintain as large a green space as possible um, and offer seating and public amenity to uh, local uh, users, uh, pedestrians. The, I can answer the DC 37 question. I mean, we've been working with DD, DC 37 on their entrance and they've been viewing this, uh, you know, the development of the plaza and their access to the loading dock uh, throughout the design process. And they're on board with, um, with this access. Uh, thank you very much on that. Uh, we appreciate that. And I'm just going to take you at the promise that you're making that you will work with DOT um, and have flexibility to discuss opportunities within what we're talking about here. There are, we are providing uh, regular bicycle racks around the uh, perimeter of the building. I don't see where they are here. And uh, I mean, for pedestrian use other than just uh, city bike also just uh, to note that I don't, I don't know exactly where they are here, but I did see design items for them to be installed. So there will be public bike racks installed around the building, correct? Correct. Uh, do you know whether that's on Barclay or the north side of the street? Uh, Katie, do you remember? Where there's they are? one. So do you see? Uh, can you see my mouse mm -hmm. moving? Yes. So there's one right by that number three. Mm -hmm. There's one right to the left of this number eight. And then down on Barclay Street, there's one that uh, it's hard to see, but underneath this number three, just behind the ballers, there's another bike rack. And an, actually another one over here. Oh, bike racks, number three. Anywhere yep. you see number three. <laughs> Where you see That's number bike three. Rack. And I just want to confirm those are publicly accessible bike racks. They would not be told for you know guests or employees of BNY Mellon only, correct? Correct. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much for the questions. I would have wished that there was more green versus less, and I would have wished that we had less bollards and more creative thinking around the edges um, for the city, because quite frankly, it it's it it it's prison like every time you put bollards someplace, it's not people friendly as much as it could be. And so I, I'll leave that there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, since we've, we're reaching the one hour point, I'm going to call on other people, but please keep it brief and do not repeat anything that's already been said. So we've heard a lot already. Uh, so it'll be Cody, who's on committee, then Alice, and then Eric, because you've already spoken. So in that order, so Cody, if you'd like to go, I'll be really brief. I just have to agree with Tammy that the the ballers present sort of a fort fortress like sort of aesthetic. I work at BMCC at Fitterman Hall right across the street, and uh, I find that that, that 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 this is the final design a little disappointing because it does sort of send a message that we're you know we're cutting off from the rest of the streetscape and so. That's just that's just a thought. Um, thank you. Thank you for keeping it brief. And Alice, um, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm in a very windy area. I just want to, for the record, Betty, thank you. Remind everyone, and maybe you already did this. I apologize. I'm late to the game here. Uh, that this is the property which we have already closed a very important privately owned public space on the interior of the bank that was taken away by the lobbyist work with the bank um, a few years ago. Uh, we certainly it was very controversial. We certainly tried to keep it, and now we're seeing quite a bit of maneuvering on the exterior of the building. I just also want to remind folks that I think at the time we also had a lot a large number of people who were not supportive of having City Bank in the remaining exterior pops. So that's something that I'd like to make sure we look at the earlier resolution if that hasn't already been reviewed. Um, that is it. Thanks, Betty. Yes, thanks. And yes, the, thanks for pointing out again, the city bike being on the plaza space is actually controversial. I didn't want to leave the impression that that is a desired spot. It was a very split group. Many say put it out on the street where 
the bikes are going to be used. They don't want to encourage people up onto the sidewalks. Anyway, uh, Eric, if you'd like to speak yeah. and then we'll go to the audience. Uh, Participants. Yes, um, the main entrance, the one on Greenwich, uh, where the sidewalk is bumped out. Um, ha has it been, is it going to be a concern where I'm assuming uh, for pickups and drop offs through for higher vehicles or or any vehicles uh, to drop people off that these vehicles will now have to be farther away from the curb to allow for for their passengers to exit and the doors to swing open. Will, will that hinder uh, traffic flow? I actually think that there's no change to the drop off. If there are people being dropped off at that point uh, right now from the present diagram was whether or not they back into that space and get out. Um, actually, I think this is more protected for those people because the traffic is now kept out in a lane in Greenwich Street away from the cars. But then when 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 the vehicle stops, they have to be farther away from from the curb or now the ballers. I don't think they no. I don't think they'd be dropping off there. But, but I don't know. I don't I don't drive in or drop off there. So okay. Yeah, the um, ballers really shouldn't affect them. The point is there's nobody parked there, so they're not they're actually closer to the curb. Um the bollards being immo immovable, the, the doors would have to be, when they open, the, the vehicle would have to be sufficient away. I don't think that they would be allowed to stop there. I, I'm not certain. It looks like, is that, no, it looks like only really one lane there. If I was dropping anybody off, I would go around the corner uh, to one of the other sides. I mean, that's just me. And people want to get dropped off closer to the main entrance. That, that's what I foresee. Um, my other question is, will there be removable bollards uh, so that in case emergency, um, maybe Con Ed or, or a city agency needs to have a vehicle on the sidewalk? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are removable bollards in many areas along this, uh, this uh, perimeter that were designed, you know, per the requirements to get people on and off the sidewalk or also, not people, um, the emergency vehicles, I guess. Uh, Katie would be able to answer that better. Yeah, it's probably hard for you to tell from this drawing, but it, <laughs> there's little um, bollards that don't, aren't filled in. There's two right here. That, as you go around along the curb line, we have various spots where we have removable bollards for utility access, for FDNY access, um, as well as for the bank's operations to, you know, still maintain uh, snow removal along the sidewalk. And last question is, what is the distance between between the bollards if they're in a line? They're five foot on center or four foot clear distance. Okay, thank you. Yeah, which is the standard. Actually, that's the required distance. Right. Correct. Thank you. So the last person then will be. Excuse me, I have to scan down here. Uh, if you could, well, there are no hands up anymore in the participant section, so I guess we are done. And I thank everyone for the presentation. Uh, Betty, don't we have to vote? Yes, we're going to talk about a resolution in general, but I still want to thank people for the presentation. Because they don't really have to stay for the resolution if they don't care to. Anyway, does anyone have any comments about the resolution? Because as far as I'm concerned, it sounds as if we are in approval if kind of situation. And what I have down is Manhattan Community Board 1 supports revocable consent for Bank of New York at 240 Greenwich. If the current plan, sorry, my eyes are so tired. If the pedestrian path and access to all buildings and streets are available and protected during construction. Uh, if the part of the road. Oh, sorry. You go down to the end. I have too many versions of this. 
That community board one supports revocable consent if the current plan, which solely relies on bollards, is modified so that it uses plantings. I don't think that's in a consensus of most people, so I'm going to cut that out. Uh, if the pedestrian, yes. Could you put that up on the screen so people can see? Because I'm not. I so can't. Sure. I have no access to do that. Okay. Well, Onej does. I'm I sorry, can. but everybody, every other committee reads what they're going to do. I don't see why we are held to a very different standard. It needs to be exactly what we vote on and exactly what's seen. We the problems that we have is when things change from point A to point B. It would be better if it's on the screen much as we do at full board. Which has already gone through a committee and we have a draft resolution for it. Let me ask Jess, would you like to type something online? Yeah, I could do whatever, whatever we need. Great, because I can't see my screen at the same time I'm looking at something else. Or if you want to share with me something, I can, I can share it on the screen. Whatever you want. Uh, not particularly. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right. Should I just do bullets or something? Yes. Okay. So it really is a therefore be it resolved. You can make it TBIRT, just initials. MCB1, Manhattan QB Board 1, supports a revocable consent for Bank of New York, Mellon, 240 Greenwich, if the pedestrian path and access is available and protected during construction in the right of way. The community liaison is identified with a phone number that can be reached in real time for pedestrian concerns from citizens. Outreach is done to inform citizens of when the work's going to be done in advance of when the work's going to be done. Uh, the city bike dock is replaced. Well, they can't control that anyway. Never mind. You can put in there that they will work with city bike to source a station around the building somewhere. They can work with DOT. Uh, that's fine. So you can put that down as a bullet that they work with the DOT to move and restore the city bike station. I actually think it's a little odd for it to say to work and restore the city bike location. We can work with DOT to discuss it, but we wouldn't be responsible to restore. And I mean, that's DOT moves it around and city bike moves it around. I don't know. It we'll just still work with DOT to move and restore. Right. Do they still have okay. to do that? Okay. Maybe say with the goal of restoring. Mm -hmm. Work with them with the goal of restoring. 
Yeah, but I don't like restoring because we don't necessarily have the goal of restoring in the process. And they said that they said that it's now going to be a DOT property and they're not going to have any say in where it goes. Restoring it does not define any location. And I think. Is there anything else in general? Maybe remove location. So BNY uh, advocates for a an adjacent city bike station. I don't think some of that kind of detail is necessary. All we want to do is get one back in the area. Don't worry about the details later. City bike uh, Bank of New York has no real say on that. Best they can do is work with it, ask that it come back. They can't. Right. Yeah, I just think do that, anything beyond that. Sorry, I'm just trying to remove the restore and location because restoring it would indicate that we want it restored to a pops location, which was controversial and reference to a location. I just don't want it. It's to, not in a pops right now, so it can't be restored to one. It's on the street right now. Okay. But it was in the pops before. Exactly. Right, but we want it on the street and they're doing construction all around on the street. So we want it restored to a location around the building. We're not saying into the pops. Right, exactly. so we want to put restored to a building, around, restored to a location around the building. Correct. Versus just restored. Since I can't read it, I'm trusting. You got can you make it a little larger? Because I assume I'm not the only one who can't read it. Thank you for that, okay. Betty. <laughs> I mean, I'm not the only blind person. No, but also if you're on a laptop um, and you're using the app, there's a, if you look on top of what's being shared next to viewing Jess Coleman's application, there should be a number with a plus and minus, and you can actually increase your own individual view by hitting those buttons. Right, but it's still somewhat limited. Thank you for changing it to bullets, Jess. That's wonderful. So we have the pedestrian path and access is available and protected. That the community liaison is identified and that there's a phone number. We have that outreach is done to inform citizens about the work and that they work with the DOT about the city bike dock movement and bringing it back in an area around the building. Anything else in particular? That's forgotten. How is it, Tammy, your hands up for that reason? My hand is not steady. Sorry, or if it is, I can't get it down. Okay. Then if that seems to be it, can I take a roll call? And I'm going to do that simply because it is way too confusing to do it other way. Uh, well, you know what? Yeah, there are way too many people to check everybody's cameras because I have way more than just the committee members. Betty, I can help you with that. I don't mind because you must have cameras on for all. Right? So, or, or Onej can speak up and help as well, but cameras have to be on. And since I'm not going to vote as chair here, I'll vote at the full board. I appreciate everything you've gone through, but I will speak up at the full board and I will vote against this because of the bollards. Because they did not treat the public realm with the same kind of um, opportunities through the design toolkit. And I'm not a fan of basically surrounding every single building with bollards. I mean, it's. So we know I that I appreciate your aesthetics, but I want to say that if it wasn't bollards, I would probably vote it down. So I'm going to go with owners rights at this point, and I think they have the right to choose how they choose to present themselves. I said it's not at all unusual in the area. And I asked people who are visiting me what they thought of bollards and none of them even saw them. So they weren't offended in the slightest. That's good for them. I have a different take on it. I see them all through, you know, the World Trade Center campus now looks like a giant prison with, you know, getting and navigating. And I think this looks like an extension, therefore, 
and I will vote against it based on design principles and things like that. I appreciate the green that went into, but I don't like bollards on public spaces. I'm appreciative that they built out on the sidewalks, but again, bollards, bollards, bollards around an entire square block is not what I call publicly friendly. Okay, so look at the people who are, that we can avoid doing a roll call. If you are opposed to the resolution, give your name, say no and your name. No, no, no. Guess we're gonna do a roll call. Odej, do you wanna take the roll call or do you want me to? Go ahead, Betty. Okay, um, I'm taking the order that I have them. So, you know, K is a yes. Jess? Yes. Mimi? Yes. Mitch? I'm going to abstain uh, at this point until I feel more confident uh, with more information on, for myself. Okay, so you're not for it. Um, well, Trisha, well, but that's what abstain yes, means. Yes. Okay. Uh, Patrick? No. Okay. Cody? Yes. Okay, Eric? No. Brendan? No. Okay, Netta, I didn't see your name. Is Netta online? Yes, she is online. Netta, could you turn? Oh, yes, she has her camera on. Uh, you can unmute Netta. To vote? Can you unmute? Oh, yes. Hi. Can you yeah. hear me now? Yes. Um, my vote would be now. Thank okay, you. So you don't support them having right away. Uh, Detta? Detta all, yes. Okay, Carrie? Carrie Davidson, yes. Okay, let me see one, two. Three, four, five out of seven. So the vote carries, but again, it's only five out of seven. And it must be more than that. Sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Sorry, out of eleven. That actually voted. So it looks like actually it went down with only five out of 11. So there is no resolution. Betty, you need to consider whether you're doing a negative then if the positive does not pass because you must have a vote. Okay, CB1 does not choose to, to authorize the right of way. Betty, I'm sorry, this Thank is Arabella you. from BNY Mellon again. I counted six. Yeses and five no's or and well, four no's and one abstain. That's what I counted. Point of information, Betty, I counted five yeses, four no's and one abstain, meaning the measure didn't carry. Yeah, I only have five yeses. So it wouldn't have carried so we can go for the opposite and see if it turns out. The people who voted no, and this is going to be confused because Mitch voted abstain, which counted as a no, but when we flip it, it isn't going to count as a no unless he says no, or changes it to a yes. So, does CB1 support Negative New York Mellon having access to the right of way, knowing what the plan is? Arnaz would please take account. I'm sorry, Betty. Could you? Are we voting on the negative side now? I'm just going to complete. Yes, I yeah, vote? we're voting. That we're saying that we do not okay. approve. So a yes, a yes vote would be you do not approve. Correct. And and so if I abstain, then that's the opposite of the. Okay, that's. 
It means I, you don't support whatever the resolution is. Uh, I wish there was another another thing besides abstain that. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, yes. so we're voting on a negative. And again, I, I'll go first. So I'm, I'm going to vote no. Jess okay. Coleman. Oh, I'm a no as well. No, okay. Mimi. No. Is that a no? That's not a question. Okay. No. Mitch. Yes. You're yes. You're saying don't let them. Well, I'm I'm forced to because I I want to abstain, but. But you can't I, I, abstain. Right, right. So I'm, I'm voting yes because I'm I'm not uh, uh, convinced yet. Okay. Uh, Patrick. Yes. Cody. No. Okay, Eric. Yes. Brendan. Yes. Okay. Meta? Yes. Zeta? Zeta all, no. Carrie? Sorry, no. One, two. One, two, three, four, five. That's five yeses. Back to five yeses. One, two, three, four, five, six no's. Correct. Okay. Yes, still doesn't win as a negative either. So, how did the first one not go? If you have 11, Six against five. five. Only ten. I know it shouldn't have flipped that way because especially Only Mitch took a stance, which put him in a position. Oh, who was who was the? Okay, so I believe Mimi Mimi's vote did not register in the first vote. If I counted that correctly, so it was ten of the eleven eligible who voted. Okay, well then let's go back to the positive, and it passed. If Mimi was overlooked. Then it was six out of the 11 votes were a yes. So I said yes. Win, right. Win, but it was a win. Okay. You know, it's good. Yes. We, we want an answer. Full board can decide just, where they want to go. I like the bollards. Yes, Sorry. so do I. Actually, so does Laura Starr. I feel like Kevin McCarthy, for Christ's sake. I mean, if it has to be. It just, it has to be something like it's not really an option. I don't like them, but I'm voting for them because I, I understand they're sort of a necessary. I mean, it, but it really, it, it, I would hope there would be something more creative coming from your design team or from, you know, I suppose safety is concerned. Okay. Anyway, a positive resolution did then pass. By one point, one vote only. So it is very narrow, but nevertheless, we're done with that. Thank you. So let's go on to a hopefully less contentious issue than that. Yes, it's so people have a more positive view as we leave it. And look, go to Washington Market School with a more positive attitude, which they deserve to have at the start. This is an open street request for them. Carol Burroughs, the director of operations at Washington Market School, is going to present. But before that, I want to give you the DOT information that I have before she starts. So next, this is the request that came to us from Department of Transportation. Up, oh, it disappeared. It is for uh, Staple Street between Duane and J Street. It is going to be starting on July 1st, running for a calendar year through June 30th. So it is year round is a request. It is Monday through Fridays only, not weekends. It is 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day. So that's the request. It is for a closed open streets. If you go to the next slide. 
just so people can refresh themselves of where it is. It runs from, um, from Dwayne Street, right where Dwayne Park is, and runs up two blocks, but it's only the one block. You go to the next, you can actually see what the block looks like. As you can see there is no parking, so no parking is going to be lost. It's a very narrow road. Sidewalks are also very narrow. So it is a general problem and it is much more like an alley than it is a street, but nevertheless, next. Now that you're familiar with what it looks like, this is off the DOT website for full closure for schools. And that's the only kind of school street there is, is full closure. Uh, it's for private, public and charter schools. It is to support drop-off pickups, operations, as well as recess, outdoor learning, really anything the school finds usable. There is no vehicle access and no parking is allowed, although there's never parking allowed here. No bicycles are also allowed. I got that clarified. It is merely for emergency vehicles and accessoride ride is allowed to use a space as well as emergency vehicles, which people generally think of as ambulances and fire and police. Next. Yeah, and some more information that came from the DOT, bicyclists are not allowed on the open street, so they clarified that for me. Regarding the 15 feet, because who knows how wide the street is, I looked up everything and nothing gave what the actual width was. The school does not have any physical programming elements. It's just a space for kids to play on. In the event of an emergency, students only need to go onto the sidewalk or into the building. So nothing will be left behind. The DOT can accommodate excess ride if necessary. And this is a renewal request. I thought it was a new, but it's not. It's a renewal. The DOT has received no complaints in the past about this street. So if you want to go, please let me turn this over to Washington Market School and let them present. Yes, hi, Betty. Um, Carrie Burroughs here. Thank you so much for that presentation because I didn't come formally prepared with the presentation. I've never been to one of these meetings before and so far it's been lovely, so thank you. Um, yes, I think um, we, we have been operating under this open street permit since COVID began. Um, it was a way for us as the school who is located at 55 Hudson and at 134 Duane Street to get the children and the teachers outside of the school environment and masks off and get some fresh air. Um, so we've been in operation since 2021. So this is the third year that we're reapplying. Over time, we've been using it less and less with COVID disappearing, but it still is a way for us to get the children outside. Um, we have about 125 kids at our Hudson location, 25 staff members there. We have about 120 kids at the Duane Street location with about 23 staff there. So it's a way for us to not force us to be inside with 500 people with parents and gives us a chance to do our big events outside that might not normally be done in a year during COVID. Um, we have been working very heavily with the residents in the area and the board and the super at the building that we rent from at 55 Hudson to make sure that we don't interfere with any construction or any projects that they're doing in the alley. Um, and we have been using it less and less as the years go on. Thankfully, COVID's leaving and we feel a little safer to stay inside and bring things inside. But I do realize that this was the first year that the application made it, it seems, to the community board. So I fear that a lot of the community members feel like we are closing the street, you know, 24-7 um, according to that schedule, and it's going to be noise and chaos all the time. But I wanted to come here to reassure them that it has not changed in the last few years, and if anything, we've been using it less. And I wanted to come here to speak to anyone that I haven't spoken to prior to this meeting to um, express to them any of their concerns. Yes, Mitch, if you'd like to speak. Yes, uh, Carrie, first of all, in, in principle, I'm 100% for this, especially the opportunity for the kids to get outside. So just my yes. question is, Betty had mentioned that 
that this is going to be year round. So my first question is, is the Washington uh, Square Market open? Is your school open year round? Washington Market School, thank you. Um, we are opened uh, September through June. We do have a small summer program that lasts about three weeks. Um, okay. It's, I, think I was it just is, wondering if it lot. needed, like, yeah. when the schools, like, for the months the schools are closed, uh, is it necessary to keep the that, that program, you know, the, the, the open street? Or is it just too much of a hassle to just like take it out for one month? Uh, because it's not necessary. I was under the impression, I could be wrong. I was under the impression that's the way the application gets filed. It didn't really okay. give us a begin date and an end date, but I'm happy to amend it if there's No, no, I'm, yeah, I was just wondering how maybe, like I said, uh, um, if, if it helps the kids, great. I was just wondering if, if schools close for a month or two, you know, how some of the other uh, uh, community board members felt because, uh, you know, just to try to have the best for everybody. But in principle, I'm going to vote yes for this. I just was wondering about that one specific thing. Thank you. Uh, yes, before I went to other people, I was going to say, in fact, if it's any day that the school is not in session, so even if it's holidays, if the school yeah. is not in session, that, that the school won't close the street. Correct. Okay, okay that sounds good, Betty. Okay, great. Uh, Brendan and then Eric. Also in support of this, um, just a, a point of interest, but will you all continue to put up like some kind of blocks during those periods just to keep kids safe, et cetera? Yeah, so um, when we first started this, there was very specific instructions. We, we have um, a set, two sets of barricades that we have that are labeled the Washington Market School. They're very specific instructions. Initially, we were told to put them in a certain, certain specific location at the end of either end of the street, even though it's just a one way street that normally can be used. We are told not to block the crosswalks and we were told in the past to leave a 6 foot of uh, 4 foot wide space for bicyclists. So that's something that's new that I just heard here. So we've always placed them um, exactly in the same spot. And just so you know, we also have, um, we always keep both sides of the street manned by administrators and at all times that the, that the uh, street is in use. Great. Thank you. Yep. Great. And Eric. Yeah, I just want to confirm. So the uh, adjacent property owners on that street, they're all okay with this. No, <laughs> um, we, we have, I have heard just today. I received an email with some concerns. I addressed it the same way I was addressing it with you and I haven't heard back from them. So they might be. You know, here to comment, which is why I wanted to show up. Um, I think in the past there have been some concerns about the noise. It is an alley, and um, sometimes you know the echo, the noise can echo up. And you know, especially during COVID, when a lot of people were working from home, um, you know, everyone was home. We were in school, and we tried to be very accommodating and keep the noise down. Um, the one thing I will say to you all here on the board, as well as anyone that's listening, is we aren't using it the way we used to use it during COVID. You know, COVID, it was the kids, you know, taking their masks off, running in the back, screaming and yelling and shouting and jumping. It, it's not that anymore. And, and also over the years, we've grown to learn that it is noisy. So we, we are making every effort to not, you know, keep it low. Let's not use chalk on the walls. Like, you know, use it in a more respectful way to respect their space as well as our space. Um, we also have been in talks with the residents. I met with two of the board members at the residence that owns the building that we rent from um, because there are access um, doors, back doors to some of the residences that are on the west side and the east side of Staples Alley. And, and often those residents need to use those entrances and exits. Um, again, reiterating that I work very heavily with the super of our building and very willing to work with any other building to keep those sidewalks clear so people can access their, their doors whenever they want to. And especially for like move out days, if they have construction going on, we are, we are always told when that's happening. So we just don't go out on those days. So. Thank you. And you plan on continuing that? Uh, yes. And I'm going, I want to say to anyone who might be here, the, the amount of times that will be out there will be significant, significantly less. We're talking about a handful of times a year for the events that we can't house the entirety of our community. So it, it is less and less and less each year. Thankfully, knock on wood, COVID's going in that direction. So we're very happy to be back inside. We really are. 
Yes, we're glad to hear you're talking to the neighbors and also that the DOT has received zero complaints so far, even during the years that you claim were noisy. But I'm gonna ask Carrie, if you wanna step up and say something, Carrie Parker Davidson. Yeah, I'm I'm a resident at 55 Hudson. My kids went to Washington oh. Market, so um, so maybe I should recuse. But um, I do notice in the attendee panel that there are people who are um, my neighbors. So I'd like to hear them speak. Um, my only my only question is um, if it's only for a handful of times, is Open Street the right process? Um, but I understand that this is the process that you have available. So, um, to the extent that that's the process available, um, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm comforted by the fact that you've been in touch with the super of our building and various residents. And, um, I'm sure that there's a way to, to satisfy all the parties as long as there's good communication. So, uh, with that, I think we should, we should hear from the attendees. Yeah. Thanks. And please, uh, Michael, Sharon and Sarah, those are all. Neighbors that you're aware of, Carrie? Uh, yes, those are. Okay. You know, I'll take you in that order. So, Anish, if you'd unmute them, but first Michael, then Sharon, then Sarah. Uh, Michael, you you unmute. Section? Uh, Michael, are you there? Are you having trouble unmuting? There we go. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, thank you, um, Carrie, for explaining all of that. Um, unless I've, I've missed something, we, we've not been contacted about this. Um, we're 25% of the frontage of the block that's concerned, and, and we don't know what's happening. Um, I also. And, and you are calling, you, where do you live? Are you at 55 Hudson or are you? 171 Duane. Okay. And we have people in our like building. So we were under the impression by filling out this application, it goes to the community board, which goes to all your people. That that's what we were told three years ago when we first started the application process. I I, I don't know about what 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 the community board mails out to people in our building. I think it's nothing, but I'm I'm not sure. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But certainly we weren't apprised of that. And COVID was an uh, obviously an extreme situation where annexing. Staple Street periodically for playground is perfectly fine. I mean, we're neighbors, but now that COVID's passed, uh, I'm, I'm, it does seem like we're an, you're annexing Staple Street, and, and which is again not a huge issue. But I'm wondering, mm -hmm. kind of what Pat Moore had mentioned earlier in this call, who is our community liaison? Who who can we speak to? If uh, if if usage of the uh, either it's it's we're not aware it's going to be happening that there's going to be a schedule that we were uh, unaware of uh, that the noise level is just too much for us to be conducting business I mean for everybody on this call imagine that you go to your office and and spontaneously outside your front door is a playground so it's it's very disruptive for folks who are who are working from home uh, and so. And we're, we're very accommodating. We simply want a process that we can understand what the schedule is, the duration of the, of the interruption, because it's impossible to do business while playgrounds are, are in, in, uh, in, uh, in, are being active and are noisy. So how can we, how can we have some way of communicating, um, that is, uh, that has traction? Yeah, uh, completely. Un I, I can answer that a hundred percent. First of all, apologies. Um, I've taken on this role very recently. Um, there were four other people in my role prior to me coming on, so bear with my, my ignorance of the past, but um, I would be the person in charge of this. And for, for the times that we're talking about, I, I've been very in very good communication with the super at 55 Hudson, and I would definitely like to get a list of all, everyone around that entire um, Staple Street, so there's a way I can contact them all and give it very much advanced notice about the events when they're happening and see if there's an issue with those days and times for other people as well. So that would be my answer. It would be me um, directly providing advanced notice um, and checking in to see if that would be okay still. So. Yeah, that, that that would be great. And I'll 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 be quiet on this. I'll relinquish. I've said my piece. Um, my uh, my my only hesitation on that kind offer, Carrie, uh, is that it's entirely in your discretion to 
decline our objection. And that doesn't really work that well for us. Uh, and so where, when there's a traditional permitting structure where there's a government or a community entity that's a third party arbitrator to uh, to say, well, that's a fair concern or that's abusive use or that's annexing an alley that that uh, people who are working on that alley um, find very disruptive to their to their livelihood. You can you have 100 percent power to decline that concern. Fair. Let's hear from the other two people, and then, yeah, I want a few, a little bit more definition of what you mean by uh, advance notice for planned events, because what, what you do about planned events is that really all you use it for. But let me just close this door. I'm getting a little. Sure. And when she comes back, Sharon, if you'd like yeah, to speak. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> um, so you want some definition? A little bit more definition about planned events, right? So normally when I would, when we are using the alley, I would send the super a full schedule. So he would look it over and tell me if there's any issues going on in the alley. So I always can let you know in advance as far off as you need when we would like to use the alley. Do you mean like um, you give a week's worth of scheduling a week in advance or? I, I could I could actually probably give you more than that. I could probably in the summer tell you the days that we're gonna use it for. Um, and if we don't use it, that's, if I gave you a list of 10 days that we're gonna use it or five days we're gonna use it and we don't use it because of weather or something, we wouldn't have a makeup date, you know? So. Okay, thanks for explaining that, Sharon. Like to unmute? Sharon, there you go. Hi, there are two of us here on this computer, Sharon Desjardins and I am Sally Hines. We're board members at 55 Hudson Street and we met with Carrie yesterday morning to discuss this. So she's well aware of some of our concerns. We were alarmed at the nature of the permit application because it seemed to suggest five days a week, all day, the alley would be closed off to vehicular traffic and maybe other kinds of use. We understand from Carrie that that's not what she intends and that she intends a far more limited use of the alley as an open street and that it will at this point be special events rather than children's classes or parent coffees. The problem with having a lot of events or closing off the alley a great deal is that that alley is hugely important to 55 Hudson Street, partly for convenience, but also for safety. The only other entrance to 55 Hudson Street is the front entrance, which has brick stairs and is not safe for all of our residents. We have one enormously visually impaired woman who walks with a white tip cane. She would not be safe on those front stairs. If someone needs to pick her up and take her to a doctor's appointment, she would not be safe going out the front way, the way she would be safe going out into the alley where there's no stairs. We had a wheelchair person here for quite a while with Parkinson's. Similarly, he could not use the front stairs. He could only come out through the back alley. And even though he has now, he's not in the building any longer, we do have guests in wheelchairs. There are plenty of times when that back alley is critically important to us. People with strollers should not be using the front stairs. And even hand truck deliveries we have now banned from the front entrance because they were damaging those brick steps to the point where the building had to re, um, redo the whole thing at considerable expense. The back alley, in other words, it's a major convenience and it's also a safety issue. Um, for these reasons, to be barred from the alley or to have access to vehicles barred from the alley is really extremely serious to us. Now, we understand from Carrie that she doesn't plan to use the alley as much as she used to as much as Washington Market School used to use it. They used it at first for students to come out and take their masks off and get fresh air. We all understood how important that was. And they also used it for parent coffees. 
Now, it's not very desirable for those uses because a lot of people use it as a dog run. The map <laughs> is filthy. There are rats. There's one rat box of dead rats at one end of it. It's not a good place for children to play. And when we had the discussion yesterday with Carrie, she was in full agreement with that. And I can see she's nodding now online because no one really wants children playing in that alley in the condition it's in now. Our superintendent, Mark, hoses it off daily, but that is not enough. And Carrie's staff was also cleaning it to try to make it be safe. But it's, it's a challenging space. And at this point, it looks like Washington Market School wants to use it for special events like the pumpkin parade. We have no objection to that. The building is fully ready to consent, cooperate, plan in advance. Our superintendent, Mark Broderick, has worked with Carrie. She's been very accommodating. He's been very accommodating. We have worked this out and worked it out well. But please understand, it's not because the, the alley is of negligible importance to the building and its residents. It's of extreme importance to us. And obviously, we're happy to share it with Washington Market School. I mean, my son went there. I happen to love the school. But um, it's got to be a shared situation here, or you're going to cause some safety issues as well as considerable inconvenience. Yeah, thank yeah, you, thank so, you much. so much, Sally. Sally. Um, um, it's reverberating a little bit. We did have we that did discussion, have discussion yesterday, yesterday. And, and, and I, I hope, hope that, that I expressed, I expressed to, you to you. Do you have to have two speakers, speakers on? on? Should we mute ourselves? Say if anybody on phone as well as the computer, please turn off one of them or mute it. Is it just me happening? Ah, oh, perfect. You fixed it. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, the, the last thing that we would ever want to do is, is not be neighborly and do the, the wrong thing for any of our neighbors. And, and I'm hearing all the concerns and you know, we, we were looking for a way to make this work for a few times a year for, for our big events that cannot house um, our entire community. Um, we are, I am taking personal responsibility that I don't want to put anyone out. And I feel like I've definitely addressed Sally and Sharon's concerns in this respect. We would never, we have never, and we would never stop anyone from going to the residents in the alley. We, our plan is to use it a handful of times a year just for those big events. We would definitely try our best to communicate with everyone. I'm, I'm starting to make a list of everyone on this call to make sure I get every building. But I, I want to say it here. I mean, if this is distressing our neighborhood, I, I don't want that to be about this. You know, I'd rather cancel the pumpkin parade than, than have our neighbors not look kindly to the Washington Market School. So, so we're basically looking for a way to make this work, but I'm not married to this over my relationship with the neighborhood. So I'm happy to be here and address concerns and, and see if there are more people that feel this way. Uh, we don't want to put anyone out. That's not our goal here. So. Thanks, Carrie. Then let's hear from Sarah and the call in user. And I ask uh, Kate Scherer if you would keep in mind at the end, I'm going to ask you what other options the DOT might have to work out but it sounds like very limited things that Carrie wants to do with the Washington Market School that would also allow them to address these issues that are being raised by the various residents. And I, Betty, before we go kind of like have Kate come down the road, has anybody talked about SAPO permits? If it's half a dozen street fair closures, doing it like we do any other company that wants to close a street for an event? Terry, is that limit? Is it that limited for what you want to do? This is to me, and I really appreciate you all sticking with me. Like it, it really went from a lot of uses of the back alley, but after hearing some of the residents' concerns, we just stopped using it. So, so this is my first year that we're not we're only using it a handful of times. 
So it could very well be we're under the wrong permit. I don't know. I, I appreciate anything that you could help guide us with. Well, the reality is if you call it a parade, you need a SAPO permit, even if it is an open street. So you'd have to check yeah. that out anyway. You may yeah, not be not saving really yourself. A it's not really a parade. It's just a couple of pumpkins on tables and families walking up and down. But, um, but I'll stop calling it a parade. <laughs> yeah, please, thank you. Well, let's see what the other people have to say, Sarah, and the call-in user, and then for completeness sake, we'll see what Kate has to say for moving forward. Yeah. Hi, this is Sarah Hollebeck. I am a resident and board member of 165 Duane and representing the board. Um, my son also went to Washington Market, so I know the school quite well. Um, in addition to the accessibility concerns, which we also shared, um, the work from home situation um, is very challenging. As you know, probably Carrie mentioned this, the echo in that alley carries all the way up to the 10th floor. Anything that happens in the alley can be heard on both sides and it really reverberates. It's quite loud. Um, we have an additional concern around how this might affect garbage collection for residents and local businesses. Galini Fidelli is downstairs on our building on that corner. There's deliveries as well for the restaurant. That's the primary delivery entrance. So I'm not sure how that would happen. Um, the, the other thing is, is Dwayne and Staple and that intersection in particular get utilized extensively by the entertainment industry. Our street is shut down like every other weekend during the day. We're not even allowed to walk to our building, even though I know you're legally allowed. They tell you you can't because they're filming and we want to support them as well. And so I would agree that like, while theoretically, you know, a pumpkin parade is wonderful and time here and there is okay. This type of permit doesn't seem like the appropriate signal to send to the community. Um, it does feel like it's an annex. I will also add that um, a few years ago, security was increased at Washington Market, and we started to see like secret service type people on the corners. It doesn't send the right tone. It it makes it feel precious and exclusive. And I think that's the last thing that Washington Market would want, given its roots. Um, I concur with the previous speaker, my neighbor, that. Um, Usage from time to time is absolutely appropriate. Like, of course, having a, a small event outside would be wonderful. If you're looking for recess, um, this neighborhood is blessed with outdoor space. My son used to take the kids to Washington Market Park, to Dwayne Park. And I'd be curious, it really, is this the right permit for what you're trying to do? Yeah, okay. we we definitely did not. We, we did use it for recess during COVID. We haven't used it since. Um, there has not been a class that's been out there this year at all. And, and I agree with you. It might be the, the wrong permit. I, I just not sure how it changed because our usage changed and we, we've been listening to, you know, our neighbors. So it, it could very well be we're in the wrong lane. Um, and we do have it. We do have security agents. It's kind of a necessity nowadays. So. I apologize if that feels a little overwhelming to you. I'd like to talk to you maybe off uh, off record and we can maybe fix that part for you too, okay? Thank you. Then let's go into the call-in user. If I know if you could identify that person with their hand up. Uh, yes, uh, call-in user 248802, can you, you can unmute. Uh, maybe if I move them over, it'll be easier. Uh, you may unmute and speak. Call in user number eight. Uh, I don't see a message or anything. I was going to say, I don't see any hands up anymore. Maybe they've changed their mind. You might have to explain to unmute. You have to push. Whatever. I don't see any hands up anymore. No, because I moved them over to panelists. So to maybe okay. help with the situation since they're on a, a phone, but because it's supposed to be easier to unmute. You, uh, 
caller and user call the first six numbers of their phone number so they recognize that's who you mean. Please. I did call in user number eight, uh, phone number 248-802. You may unmute. And you can do that by pressing star six. Let's see. Okay, let's move on. This is taking way too much move time. On. Let's go on. Uh, hey, do you have anything to say from the DOT perspective of a program you think of that might be more yeah. suitable? Um, sure. Uh, thank you, Betty. Uh, my name is Kate Scherer. Um, I'm the Lower Manhattan Borough Planner at the Manhattan Borough Commissioner's Office. Um, just before I get into that question, I want to address, um, it was mentioned, the notification process. Uh, DOT sends out notification letters to uh, community boards and elected officials for the open streets. Um, and then there's a 45-day comment uh, window. Um, and also in regards to complaints, um, in addition to liaising with the school itself, folks can also send um, direct complaints to our office as well um, that we share with our public space unit um, to try to troubleshoot and address to the best of our abilities. Um, I have a question for Carrie. I, I'm just, you've mentioned a few times you're not using the open street as often as you used to, I, I guess, ballpark like once a week how often would you say you're using it right now um i would say less than that this this past year um, okay yeah a handful okay um tammy did mention um sapo uh, which is a separate office from the dot where you would apply um, in advance for a permit to close the street. Um, and there are different types of permits you could get for depending on the size of the event um, that also come with accompanying fees, um, which may be waived because you're a school. But again, I don't represent SAPO, so I can't confirm if that's the case. Um, but based on what you're saying about the current usage right now, um, I can share that with our uh, public space team, the people who handle the permits and the applications, let them know what the current usage is and see if it is possible to adjust um, your application and your permit um, based on the feedback from the community board as well as like your actual usage. That might be helpful. Um, that would be great. Thank you so much. for. The, and you said SAPO, S-A-P-O? Yes, so I can look into it. that is the street activity permit office. I'm learning it every day. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yes, well, let me hear from Carrie since she's big in this neighborhood. And so then I'll ask, just... then we'll go to the other Carrie from Market School to ask, do you really want to pursue this at this time or do you want to work some things out and then come back to the committee? Once you've worked with the DOT with where you really do want to go, what you're really going to ask for. I, I personally, not, not as a representative of the school, I personally would like to walk away. Let me see if I can work something out that's different because I, I don't want to put any of our, our neighbors in this position where they feel like it's too noisy or they can't work from home or they can't access. It, it's too it's not what the intention is. So I am happy to go and look into SAPO. And as Kate mentioned, um, possibly there's another way we can talk with the DOT about, you know, maybe there is a way we can have a permit for like, you know, three, four or five days. Um, and then I can come back to the community members and see if that's something that they would be amenable to. Um, Actually, if you're willing to do that, it would make our job a lot easier with trying to guess. And how much to restrict you in ways you don't want to be restricted for things you yeah. probably weren't going to use anyway. I, I don't want to make more work for you. You all work too hard to begin with. So <laughs> why don't you go back and work out with Washington Market School and your neighbors? What is it that works for you that DOT can help you with or SAPO if they're the more appropriate group? That sounds wonderful. Um, I appreciate all of your help and your communication. And I'll follow up with you once we have some sort of resolution. 
first let me ask Kate uh, Pure, do you need anything else done or can they just withdraw temporarily and put everything on suspension? I will have to check um, first thing tomorrow and get back to you. Okay, because there isn't a, well, we're kind of time sensitive. On the other hand, it, there really isn't much of us to, for us to act on at this point because there are so many things to be smoothed out with what appears to be very, very limited use compared to all day, every day, Monday through Friday, 365 days a year request, which is what we're dealing with. So Kate, is there anything we can do to give time to the school to come up with what they really want to do? I, again, I will have to check. I can't say definitively. Okay, that doesn't leave Carrie. That doesn't leave you with a whole lot, Carrie Burroughs. It will make it work. <laughs> We're used to working under pressure. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll make it work. I, I'll get some answers. Kate, can I just ask who would I contact? It wouldn't be directly I, to you then. Just go. I can um, put my uh, email in the chat for you. That would be um, great. And then I can connect you with my colleague who. Um, We'll be able to assist you further. That would be fantastic. Appreciate it. I have a process question because there is an application on file. Um, no matter what happens, I believe, and please correct me, I'd really love to be wrong on this. Uh, I believe that we actually might have to take a vote to have an opinion. If she, because if for any reason she cannot withdraw the application and it flows through the process, we will not have opined. Is that correct? I believe that is correct. So therefore, unfortunately, sorry, transpo team, but um, take a straw poll. I mean, I think I kind of heard based on what the public said about where we might be going because we don't believe that the open streets would satisfy the community needs. And Carrie, if she, even if she intends on withdrawing it, if it's not, for example, withdrawn or pulled from the system in time, we still need to have an opinion on file. Yes, no, I, I agree. So I think it really should be worded that we oppose the resolution, we oppose the request as made, because it doesn't meet the needs of the school or the residents. So we encourage the school to go back, work with the residents and come up with some alternative plan for the space that they do need. Is that, clear enough? Is that clear enough? Because I have the tape I can go back to to write down the wording that I just said, but. So this is a measure of rejection of the current request, which is Monday through Friday, 36, 365 days a year uh, from 9 till 6 p.m. But asking them to please go back, Washington Market School, to work with the neighbors to create the kind of time and that they do need and deserve, but work it out with the neighbors and come back. So I'm going to put it as, as an assumed yes, unless you vote otherwise. So for those of you who want to vote no on the resolution, give your name and the word no. Okay, are there any recusals? Which there, I, Carrie, you actually don't have to recuse because you don't make profit off this either way. That's true, okay. So you're not, a, you, you don't have to be, you aren't a recusal, you're whatever else you want to be. Are there any abstentions? Shetta abstain, Shetta all abstain. Okay. Then I'm going to assume that everybody else is a yes. And I will have to go back and count to see who's here at the moment. Okay, Onesha, you're getting a count of who's here and has their cameras yes. on? I am going through. I am going through right now. Tell me when you're done. Yes. Oh, Lee is here. Lee is here. 
Great. Either way, this is going to pass with, with no no's and one abstention. Mm -hmm. Are you done? Yep. Great. Um, we, yeah. Great. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you, Kate, for working on this and see how we can push it forward. Betty, did Kate, so put, much. did Kate put her, uh, her uh, contact information in the chat? She did. I, I received it. Thank you. Okay, because it could you tell me, I'm on my phone. Yeah, don't worry about it. The people who need it have it, so no, they're I, okay. I would like to get it for an unrelated open street thing and not, not deal with it now. But I, I can do that on the yes. do that. Reach, so, reach out to the office, no problem. Well, okay, can you just send me it? That's when, no problem. Uh, just email it to me, Betty? Yes. Thank you. No problem. So thank you, and we'll move on to the next because we have one more resolution and we do have a time frame. But in fact, it looks like Mimi, you have to leave already. So do I. I'm so sorry. Okay, well, let me see if we still have enough people for quorum. Okay, with nine people, we should still have quorum. So let's move along with City Bike. And I was not able to get someone to present in this topic, so I apologize for that. So I spent a lot of time putting together the information of what's out there and then deciding, finding you deciding, do you want to move forward with the resolution at this time? Wait, whatever you choose to do is where we're going with this. Next. Yes, City Bike is 10 years old. You go to the next one, which was part of the reason for looking at it at this time. Surprising that someone like the New York Daily News actually came forward in, in a editorial and talked about how they have been wrong all along predicting doomsday. And in fact, it's been a great success from their perspective. Next, that's pretty widely acclaimed. There has been a constant rise in the number of riders, but as you'll see, there's been a bigger geographic area, as well as more people picking it up in each of the areas and more bikes available. Let's go to the next. The service areas, they started with just the light blue areas, expanded in 2015, 2017 to where it's a brighter blue. And finally, going on now and going continuing on through the end of next year, these darker blue areas in parts of Queens, Brooklyn, and certainly the Bronx which were not included before. So you go next, so we know who City Bike are. According to the New York Times, as of May 23rd, uh, two weeks ago, customers took 867,840 rides. That's how many rides occurred by the beginning of May. So in the first, really the first four months of this year. Streets blogs reported that there are an average of 94,419 rides per day. So if those are wondering about how big is City Bike, obviously a lot of people rely on it. In May of 2023, there were over 130,000 rides per day. So weather also plays a role. We have more bike share in New York City than anywhere else in the United States or anywhere else in Europe. There are just under 30,000 bikes, and just over 6,000 of them have pedal assist, which is the only kind of e-bike that is available with City Bike. City Group has extended its sponsorship arrangement through 2034. Remember, this was one of the reasons also asking for the resolution last month, but in fact, the deal has been signed with City Group and their sponsorship. The deal is worth 70,000, 70 and a half million dollars. The details were undisclosed and still are, as far as I know. More than five, more than half a million people ride bicycles in New York City every day, so it's not just City Bike. That's more than the number of cars that ride on the BQE and the Cross Bronx Expressway combined, so it is not a minor form of transportation. There are more than 1,800 city bike stations around New York City. 
It's six times the number that there were when it started back in 2013. 51% of the riders are people of color, for those who are interested in that. It is not an all white issue. 64% of the network is outside of Manhattan. So being more than half, it is not all a Manhattan issue. It will be available in 70% of all city run public housing by the end of this year. So they have been making an effort to expand it to those in public housing owned by the city. Next. City, but this was also from the New York Times. Oops, it disappeared. Okay, City Bike does see an electric future, which is good. It's looking to have in station charging, which means the docks themselves will be linked up to electricity so that the docks will charge the batteries rather than workers that now travel around switching out batteries. This will make it a lot more reliable and reduce the demand on the workers themselves. What was interesting to me was that electrifying just 20 to 30% of the existing docking stations would reduce battery swaps by almost 90%. So it's interesting that the people who are using the E uh, pedal assist bikes are located in really just 20 to 30% of the docking stations. Workers would still need to visit the stations because they check the brakes, the chains, and the tires. The number of workers to relocate bikes is up in 2023. However, I have also heard complaints about that. The city has installed, for those who say, well, what about infrastructure? That is an issue for city bike and all bikes. Uh, City Bike installed 26.3 miles of the required 30 miles last year. Uh, as far as this year, they've done four of the 30 required miles that were mandated for this year, but 22 more miles are under construction, which would make it 26 or still barely half. So there is a problem with infrastructure keeping up. Next. As far as what you hear from city bike stats reported by streets blog, which does a lot of reporting about things on the streets, a reduced fare membership is has up to 15,774 people were signed up for the $5 a month program. That's nearly 40% of the 11,365 members that there were this time last year. So that is a very big increase. That could be explained, it certainly is explained partially by the zones that now have city bikes that didn't before, but it's also an increase. And it is people in NYCHA homes as well as people who are on SNAP or uh, use other federal programs for uh, that measure poverty levels. Reduced fare members took an average, this was very interesting, took an average of 238 trips in, 200, in 2022 they actually traveled 77% more often than regular city bike members. So it is not something where they just plain tried it out and then dropped it, but they are very frequent users. In fact, they're more frequent than the average user is. Overall city bike ridership is up 26% compared to the same four months that started last year. So there is growth. Even with the gradual post pandemic recovery of many transit systems, City bike still ranks 30th biggest transit system in the country. That's not just bikes, that's counting all forms of transit. Subways, buses, everything. Next, to take us back to, yeah, so should we do a resolution at this time is the question you're going to answer. And if you go to next, before I start to hear from starting with Mimi and then Cody, uh, I looked set. Okay. I looked at trans alts ideas to see, cause here we have a bicycle advocacy group and what were their ideas about city bike? Because again, the, the, uh, the agreement has already been signed with city group. Keep in, uh, they say to keep city bike memberships and passes affordable for all New Yorkers to expand bike share service to the areas that are not currently served. 
and to make panel assist e-bikes share accessible by capping the cost to longer commutes within and between the boroughs. So let's hear from some people with their hands up. So Mimi, then Cody, then Eric, and then Tammy. I'm gonna have to go after this. So I won't really be able to stick around to hear what anybody has to say about it. Sorry about that. Um, I think that city bike needs to continuously educate uh, their members on the laws of traffic um, that pertain to bicycles in the city. Uh, no riding on sidewalks, uh, walking through parks, stuff like that. Um, and that it should be like a regular training thing. Like I have training at work annually um, so that I remember all the regulations. I think that that would be an important addition to what they currently do. Uh, Cause it just seems like they're on sidewalks a lot, but it's a great, great program. I'm glad we got to hear that from you before you left. So thank you. Cody. Um, I, I think we do need a, res a resolution, but it has a lot along the lines of um, the letter that I shared with, with you um, from a handful of electeds, including the borough president, who are calling for City Bike to do an internal self audit uh, to look at ways you know the system can be more well run, more efficient. For instance, you know the repair of existing bicycles and the expansion of e pedal uh, e bikes because a lot of people have discovered e bikes and used them to go long distances. Um, you know, into to, to parts of the city that, that they don't, they aren't able to, or, or whatever, to ride a regular bike along. Um, you know, and also look at why the uh, system is not, you know, it's been in talks with Con Ed for like since 2021 to electrify the station so that the bikes, the pedal assist bikes could charge, you know, at the station, which a lot of uh, what uh, the city council person Eric Botcher was saying in the letter was that his constituents often go to get an e-bike and find that it's the battery's dead, or you know, it's just a lot of frustration with that. Also, the maintenance of the docking stations themselves. You know, oftentimes you check one out and then you have this, you have you stress out about, oh my gosh, is there going to be a space for me to park it or dock it? That seems to be a, a problem that a lot of people. Are reporting with the current system. The system, of course, is run by Lyft. Lyft is is financially in sort of questionable straits right now. Um, they laid off around twelve hundred people, twenty six percent of their workforce, um, um, just this past year, the year before, I believe. And um, so there's some questions as to whether or not Lyft is even capable of fulfilling its responsibility effectively. Um, in the manner that they should, considering the importance and scope of this this particular program, the city bike program. So I, I feel like this, you know, the DOT or you know, perhaps there needs to be sort of like support for the idea of the city putting, you know, taking a closer look at Lyft as a as a vendor, um, and whether or not you know there perhaps should be some sort of quasi public private, you know, more more of a public voice. Boston municipalized. Uh, their city bikes, I mean, their, their bike show program, uh, but the, the um, uh, but Lyft is still the operator. They're not the owner. Whereas LA and Austin all municipalized their system. So there's a few things that uh, I think that need to be discussed as far as uh, city bike is concerned. Okay, thank you for that, Eric. I think city bike has been a success. It's uh... It's another option for transportation, especially for short or medium distances. You know, for me, I, I, yeah, maybe within the borough, it's great um, and offers options. I, I do wish they would have more pedal assist and, and uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's fun. <laughs> okay, um, but I, I do want them to, to uh, be more careful. Maybe it's not careful, but to take into account the locations of, of docking stations. For example, in, in CB1, um, on Peck Slip between South Street and Front Street, they put a docking station the whole length of the, of the street 
and there's a park in that street. There's there's an area beneath the FDR, which is all open space. So I recognize and I know there's a need for city bike docking stations, but it shouldn't be when it's cited, wherever it's decided, it should take into account the negative impact to other forms of transportation. The city bike should not be necessarily at the ex always at the ex expense of other forms of transportation and other and public space. If if there's a if there's another location with without inconveniencing other people modes of transportation, please consider it, especially when we have open space in that vicinity. Um, and then also with Water Street between Fletcher and John Street, the whole block was taken out. We also have that area underneath the FDR, which could also be used for docking station. I don't I didn't I don't know all of the, the full demand of it, but when the city when when City Bike took when the DOT gave City Bike that space, it also lost revenue because that that was a, a muni meter. You had to pay in order to park there. So there there was some utility loss. I mean, um, some use factor that was lost from with those docking state with that docking station, as well as loss of revenue for the DOT. So please, I just like there to be more judicious selection of of docking sites. Also. I, I think the, I don't know how how it should be done, but city bikes should also encourage users to have helmets. <laughs> I, I always wear a helmet and I because I, I know what could happen. All it takes is one fall and and or one crash and you'll be sorry. So I, I see a lot of city bike riders. They don't wear helmets. I wish there was a way to encourage their users to have helmets. Um, and. And. Um, they need to know the rules of the road that they, especially the tourists or even, even the local people that use it. They don't, they don't know the rules of the road and that makes it dangerous for everyone. I'm not sure if we're ready for a resolution right now because there's all these, um, this is a complicated topic. I mean, maybe we can email uh, Betty or our comments for a future meeting. Thank you, Eric. I was coming to the same conclusion. Uh, Detta? <clears throat> okay, so I didn't. Wait, so I'm sorry. I'm I'm having having some trouble with my video. Okay. Um. Sort of, sort of to what Cody said. And also just bike share in general is it's not really profitable. When you look at how many times City Bike has already been sold in its existence, it's like what three or four companies already. Uh, and Lyft is struggling, and I don't know if they even make any money off of City Bike. I'd rather press for some public funding to go into city bike. And I'd rather press really for the obligated number of protected bike lanes to be built annually. I see those as more important than, than putting pressure on lip to, to deliver better. I um, mean, also just look at what happened in Minneapolis, right? The, the provider just pulled out, so now their bike share, nice ride, is just dead. That's it. Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> that seems to be, <clears throat> excuse me, everyone is a committee member, so we'll go on to Justine and then Tammy, who likes to be last. Thanks so much. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask is, so City Bank kind of gets its name from City Bank or whatever, and that's kind of um, free advertising. What is the City Bank, if you know the answer to the question, um, but what is City Bank's um, funding of City Bank at this point? Anything? Uh, yes, I just gave the number if you go back how many millions Sorry. it was. So they are it's, percentage wise, if we know, because I'm wondering before we look for public funding, maybe we ask City Bike to pay more. 
I'm um, city bank, sorry, to they pay more. They just signed the agreement going forward, so that's a that's a closed mm -hmm. issue. Okay, never mind. And then um, the only other comment I would have is besides loving city bike, um, I think it's a great program. Um, the one area where it makes it difficult to to um, use as a commuting tool or any place where you have to be on time getting there um, is the fact that the docks, you cannot guarantee that a dock will be empty when, the, when you get there. And um, that is having people, or workers kind of move things around or having something there where there are workers stationed to be able to take the bike so you're not being charged, but you can actually get to work on time. That would be a good thing. But I guess that in and of itself costs more money. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, my comment to make to that, especially since Kate is here and, and heard about my complaining, because um, I've heard from other community members where the docks were full, the stations were full. Mm -hmm. I have been checking since then, and in fact, there's often only one or two spaces, but in fact, there were one or two spaces. I have seen people wandering around with a bike that they can't get rid of, so why they stay so full is sort of an issue in our district versus emptiness which some other districts are complaining about. But yes, that's to be looked at. And I was hoping that you would bring up the issue you brought up, I think in a Battery Park City co Committee, about were you, were you going to Queens or somewhere, which was kind of a transit desert. Yeah. And that's... disappointed that it wasn't any city bike there. And so, although you had a membership, you were kind of stuck with nothing. And so going to build in areas- Where they're that, not. Right. And, and one area where they've asked for it, to my knowledge, is Staten Island. Yes. And they're just not going there. So in map, they were looking to do something in Queens. They're certainly, thank goodness, going up to the Bronx, but they're not, not even touching Staten Island. And I will say that um, part of the issue with Staten Island is a lot of the roads are just not um, conducive to being modified. That they can't even get one car going down the lane with down the road with the with the double you know parking on each side, let alone make a bike lane. But um, that should not be the end all and be all. They should also have some access. It doesn't seem fair. But yes, that's a really good point, Betty. Right, it's more access. Sort of building out, yes, because it's not just if you say, well, it's not in our district, it's built out. Yeah. The reality is people who live in our district can't really rely on their membership when they go to many different parts of the city. That's correct. And people can't commute with it because if they're coming from, you know, yes, that's exactly correct. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll go to before going to Tammy, since let's go last, Brendan, who's a committee member, may speak. Thank you. Um, one thing I would like to kind of jump on, and I think um, Eric alluded to this, but I would like for City Bike and the DOC to actually work closer together. Um, there are a lot of uh, docking stations on sidewalks, which then allows for riders to, they usually ride up to the docking station. So we were talking about that block around Barclay, Greenwich, and Murray, and just beyond that, where the target is, there's docking station on uh, the sidewalk, which then makes it very difficult to try to walk. Um, that's just one location, obviously, because it's city bike in front of city bank, like try to walk in that area um, anytime in the morning or during lunchtime or like a dinner time, lunchtime, five o'clock. And it's just like overrun with cyclists, um, making it unwalkable. So um, I love the program. I love what it does for the environment, but I also want to be able to use the sidewalk and walk. Um, I also, I agree we need more protected bike lanes, but also I don't, I don't get to decide this, but I don't like the idea of us giving more bike lanes and the people not using them. So I live on Barclay Street. There's literally a bike lane and a city bike dock station right there. And I regularly point out to people on the sidewalk, there's a bike lane right there. So it was made for them and they're not using it. Um, so I think there can be more um, effort both between the DOT and city bank, city bike, lift, et cetera, um, to make it so that I can actually use the sidewalks for walking. Great, thank you. Tammy, and I'm going to Cody, your hand is still up. I have one, one point to make, which was that that I'd mentioned about Minneapolis. That was actually Lyft that pulled out and suspended Minneapolis's um, bike show program. It happened in, um, sorry, in 
in March. So yes, that was that was actually lift. So that's the reason why I think some people are saying or questioning whether or not lift is is, is has the strength to continue running this program and expanding it to places where you know it isn't it doesn't exist, like in far parts of Queens, Staten Island, or out, out the outer parts of Brooklyn and the Bronx. But the issue is also does anybody else wait want wait to program? be recognized, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have two new members, and so we want them to teach them from the beginning what the rules are. Uh, Tammy, you go next, but would you like Ushma to go ahead of you or after? I always prefer the committee people to go to. You know, I try. It's. I'd love to hear the committee and the public first. Well, Ushma's not on committee, but she is on the board. So Ushma, if you'd like to speak. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Um, I just wanted to see if also some language or the consideration on as we're expanding the bike program. Also expand bike uh, education on how to, uh, you know, follow the road rules for biking. Um, I know their city bike are not the only ones who are biking on the street, but I often get run over as I'm crossing. At Pier 25 and on the West Side Highway with everyone who thinks they're doing the Tour de France um, and not stopping at the designated crosswalk. So, if there was any way to also have the bike program or DOT either do enforcement along the bike lanes or um, do more education, even in the app when people are locking and unlocking the bike, if you're pushing out, hey, you need to stop at the crosswalks, you need to go the right of way, don't go on the sidewalk. I think that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Tammy, it's your turn. And then Marianne. So I think you know if you can imagine I cheered many of the comments. Um, I agree that I I don't think we're ready to do a rezo tonight, but I do think that an education component is critical. Um, where I see a ton of our, whether it's locals or tourists is immaterial to me, but I do see a ton of people on sidewalks, whether it's going to bike stations or just in general riding on the sidewalk because they don't know where they need or are required to go. And I wondered whether or not, whether it's in multi-languages, whether it's electronic or, but specifically on each bike not just at when you have to swipe to get the bike because people swipe and they just click yes they're not actually necessarily reading it and and following the rules so really just having a and i know it'd be very difficult to get like a map that is updated on each bike and by the time the maps are updated to the thousands of bikes that are out there it would need to be updated again whether it's electronic or whatever the ability exists in today's day and age to have something that a person can understand where a bicycle is allowed and where they're not. And I think that having that investment, if you already have something that's a throttle and electric electrified bike, then that should also instantly have on it, if nothing else, an electrified map that shows where you can and can't go. And quite frankly, some kind of you know, they say that, you know, people understand that when the when the owners of Revel tell you that if the bike is in the Esplanade, they know that it's incorrect and it's tracked and that, you know, they're able to allow the user some kind of forward thinking vision by the city bike and DOT to ensure that people can get educated, people can get the information as we're looking ahead to improve this, it's already tested, it's already proved. Yeah, we want to get it everywhere that it doesn't exist now, but we also really want safety as a priority as we're going forward because people can argue all they want about a dedicated bike lane on the West Side Highway. I don't remember one when motorcycles came out or mopeds came out or anything like that, but if you're going to get more people on more bikes, we need better education and people have to follow the rules and whether it's education before or after it's just as important and enforcement i mean in enforcement 
people don't follow the rules and there's no consequences. Maybe if they got suspended from their city bike, you know, membership for riding on the sidewalks or riding places that they weren't allowed, it might be helpful. Thank you. Let's go on to Marianne and everyone else can put your hand down because that's Marianne will go last. We will not do a resolution at this meeting. I will listen to the tape again and put things together. If you want to email things to me, please do. But Marianne. Another focus for training, I think, has to be the delivery workers. They just do not understand even bicycle courtesies that you 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 honor one ways because people are looking in a certain way when they're about to cross or step out and so are bicycle riders and speaking as a bicycle rider i'm in the bike lane these things go whizzing past so close with no heads up you're supposed to speak out when you pass someone and you're supposed to pass on the left not the right so what happens to me riding could of course happen to a pedestrian. You just make one little move an inch or two the wrong way and this person is appearing out of nowhere to, to create a gigantic collision, potentially. So it bothers me that these riders are considered independent contractors and that nobody seems to have responsibility for ensuring their training and making sure they know what to do when they're out there so that they can work cooperatively with everybody who's out there. It's it's not a hard thing to pass on. Thank you. Thank you. If everyone put their hand down because you probably just have it up because you forgot to take it down. I've just moved on and I think now I can kind of move along, but resolution we'll look at next month news and updates just to keep you up to date with what's going on. Central Business District Tolling Program. This is the mandate from the 2019 law and the federal government as part of the environmental review. None of this is opinion, it's just stuff that's coming out there in the newspapers. Next, yeah, this was just an announcement that when finally the federal uh, government came out and said, yes, New York City, you can move forward. Next, to remind everyone, the tolling district, also known from the law as the central business tolling program, is everything below south, below the south of 61st Street. So it includes 60th Street and below in Manhattan only. Next, the infrastructure, and here you can see a picture of kind of what it will look like the readers that will read people's license plates or or the responders that are on your cars. They will start as soon as the environmental uh, period is over, which is really just access to the materials, nothing more. So starting on the 13th of this month, you'll start to see installation occurring. Next. So again, to remind people, in the 2019 budget, which was part of the budget bill, they had the CBD tolling program, West Street and FDR Drive, since we have both of them in our district, are exempt if you do not enter any other roads within the CBD. The passenger cars may only be charged once daily for entering or remaining in the CBD. Emergency vehicles and vehicles transporting people with disabilities, and again, that's not defined what that means, will be exempt from the charge. The state law, the fourth item is residents of the zone with incomes less than 60,000 per year will receive a tax credit equal to the amount paid in congestion charges. So that's really all there is from the law itself. To address the federal concerns, a bunch of things were added to that. One, a low income driver toll discount program. This is, it's time limited. It's only the first five years of congestion pricing whenever it starts, which is next year. It would apply to drivers that use EasyPass 
that have a household income under $50,000 per year or are enrolled in income-based government programs like SNAP or WIC. These eligible, these eligible people, this very narrow band of 50,000 are in these various programs, would receive a 25% discount each month that they travel in the congestion zone after they make 10 trips within the month. So it does not start with your first trip and it restarts every month. Tax, second thing, taxis and e-hail e vehicles are charged no more than once per day, which is something that we asked for in our CB1 resolution, because that does not negate the fact there is still every ride, the fare includes a pedestrian, a, a congestion charge to it, 275, in Uber and Lyft and those kinds of vehicles, 250 in taxis. A toll will be levied on vehicles that travel northbound on the FDR Drive, exit at East Houston Street, and then travel southbound on FDR Drive. In other words, any exit, no matter how small it is, off of FDR Drive or off of West Street will target you for a toll. Next, a discount of at least 50% on the peak toll for truck, trucks and other vehicles from midnight until 4 a.m. minimum. Uh, this was to benefit low income drivers that are traveling during this time frame to reduce the amount of trucks rerouting for environmental justice. But keep in mind, it's 50% of the peak rate, and that's assuming they will even set the peak rate as being more than double. So it may not actually be anything. We don't know. A small business working group will be established that will meet six months prior to, six months after tolling begins, and then annually thereafter. So they want to get some feeding, some feedback from small business working groups so they can kind of tweak the program if they feel it's appropriate. Next, kind of never ending things that have been coming out. The MTA has to address other federal concerns in the terms of community justice. So where before the money was going to go towards uh, funding capital improvements for the MTA, as well as the Long Island Railroad and Metro North, it also now includes an expanded city clean truck program, which helps to foot the bill uh, to replace medium and heavy duty trucks with electrified vehicles. And it will also improve the build out the electric truck charging infrastructure. It's going to build out parks and green spaces in environmental justice communities. This does not include us. It installs air filtration systems in schools that are near highways. This can affect our schools that are near the FDR or near West Street. So those schools may want to look into it if they did not change their ventilation systems during COVID and don't need it anymore. It will retrofit diesel powered refrigeration trailers at Hudson's Point Market in the Bronx. Again, doesn't affect us. It will establish new asthma centers in the Bronx and what could affect us and expand the city's asthma case management program in the schools. So if people are aware of schools that are interested for more management of the children that go to that school with asthma, they may want to look into this. Next, the MTA in its, for its own part is going to be look at ways that they can reduce their own carbon footprint. So there will be things that they will be doing. Again, another expansion of how the funds will be spent that are gained from the tolling program. Next, so many changes. So what does come next? The Transit uh, Mobility Review Board, the TMRB, which is six people, it's already been, the names are already known of those people, one by the mayor, five by the governor. They will meet and specify program details, including tolling charges and times, any exemptions, what counts as a vehicle carrying people with disabilities, et cetera. 
I'm not giving you the information because none of us know it. The TMRB is yet to do that work and announce it. There will be public sessions prior to the tolling beginning, but perhaps only 30 days in advance. That's from the law. By state law, the tolls must raise $1 billion in revenue a year. That money would then be bonded to $15 billion to pay for much needed infrastructure upgrades in the MTA network, which again includes the Long Island Railroad and the, and the Metro North, as well as buses and subways within the city. The range of tolling scenarios released by the MTA last August, and there were seven of them. Most drivers would be charged between $5 and $23, based on the type of vehicle and the time of day. For daytime, the numbers that they gave were $9 to $23, 23 of course being trucks, and $5 to $12 during the overnight hours. So again, overnight could easily be 50% of daytime. We don't know yet. The installation of infrastructure will start on June 13th and tolling will start in the second quarter of 2024. So next year. Okay. And for those who want to comment on the environmental review or want to get more information, there are some links that you can follow that'll take you. They're really all with the MTA. And next, hopefully we're done with that. Oh, to make people feel a little bit better and to put it in perspective, the alternative options to congestion pricing, addressing the challenge of reducing emissions while funding mass transportation and roads. This is one of the big dilemmas of our age and it crosses continents as well as state lines. It's not just New York City. Next. I looked and according to the Oklahoma Department of Transportation, the recent growth in drivers switching to more eco-friendly vehicles is positive for the environment in terms of public health and the environment, but also has had a negative impact on highway funding it is largely reliant, which is largely reliant on federal and state petrol taxes. This is kind of the story that even the remote areas are dealing with. Imovis is a Spanish-based firm. They are one of the many that are doing various solutions. And they are currently in Oklahoma looking for volunteer drivers to figure out how they drive and where they drive. This is the beginning of Oklahoma's program. But if you go to the next slide, you'll see Oklahoma is jo joining four other states that already have pay per mile solutions. Those, they don't call it congestion pricing, they just call it pay per mile. Those includes Oregon, Utah, Virginia, and Washington. If you go to the next one, those who are interested, Imovis is online, you can see them. Uh, and if you go to the next one, they deal with four different areas. Four hey, Instead yes. of instead of let's talking about the alternatives, we have something in front of us in New York State right now, and I know that there are people from the community who want to speak about that. Can we? Uh, yes, we can go to those in the audience. We can go to the attendees. Elizabeth Chan. Battery Park residents against congestion tolling. And our uh, public comments on the FHWA FONSI document and VPPP. On May 5th, 2023, the US Department of Transportation published a final environmental assessment, EA, for the Central Business District Tolling Program, the CBDTP, and which required the start of the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, a 45 day public review process as a condition to apply the FHWA Value Pricing Pilot Program, the VPPP. I represent a coalition of neighbors in Battery Park City that have reviewed this public document and are concerned about its evaluation of finding no significant impact, also known as FONSI. 
A coalition of residents of Battery Park City against congestion tolls do not agree that this proposal has taken proper environmental assessment or has taken into consideration our community economic needs, have not done and will require further due diligence as the VPPP plan causes environmental and economic injustices that impact our neighborhood. As of this moment, 148 Battery Park City residents responded to a Google Docs survey conducted over the past four days. 97.9% .9 of the respondents want an exemption from the congestion pricing for Battery Park City residents. 83% of the respondents agree that the proposed congestion pricing would create financial hardship for their families. Many remarked on their concern that this would drive out residents and businesses from our neighborhood. Battery Park City is home to many families. Children under the age of 18 make up 25% of the Battery Park City population. Please see the Democratic Demographic Statistical Atlas of the United States. I, I have a link and I will provide a link of this statement. Nearly half of the respondents may self-identify as persons of color. The ask, if ultimately the congestion pricing is approved, this co coalition of Battery Park City residents are asking for an exemption from the congestion pricing. In the meantime, we further ask that the Federal Highway Administration, Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, New York State Department of Transportation, and the New York City Department of Transportation further reevaluate and conduct further due diligence to study the environmental and economic impact, the increase of vehicular traffic on the Battery Park City community as it is geographically bound by the proposed exempted thoroughfares and uniquely affected in a way that no other neighborhood is in the proposed central business district. The increased traffic in, in the increased traffic poses serious public safety and health concerns, particularly for the children, families, 9-11 survivors who are battling 9-11 related diseases, and senior citizens that call Battery Park City home. The reasons for the ask. The proposed congestion pricing will burden those communities adjacent to the exempted thoroughfares. The increased con congestion along these exempted thoroughfares will result in poor air quality for residents, as well as increased pedestrian injury and death by crossing exempted thoroughfares to enter and exit Battery Park City confines. Battery Park City has limited access points to enter and exit the neighborhood. It requires all residents to cross by foot or vehicle the West Side Highway. Further, there is no subway access in Battery Park City and limited bus options. Congestion pricing will impact local businesses in the congestion zone due to a loss of customer traffic. This will create, create financial hardship for local businesses. Battery Park City residents already face high living costs and contribute additional income to New York in the form of pilot payment in lieu of taxes program. This is in addition to the New York City personal income and property taxes. Additional costs make it harder for low to middle income families, several who are minority identifying. Historically, the BPC pilot revenue has often closed MTA budget gaps. Charging additional tolls would put further financial burden on a neighborhood that does not even have a single subway station within the 92 acres that comprise the neighborhood. Consideration of minority groups who live in this area are also concerned about safety on public transport in our area. Considering Consideration of financial hardship as is stipulated and self-identified by residents in this survey current res currently residing in Battery Park City, which, which would lead to residential displacement. Many of the survey people have said that. Battery Park City has a high population of families with school children. Some of these residents rely on private transportation to and from school. There are various reasons that parents may need to transport children in this manner, including lack of proximity to public transportation and disabilities that may prevent a child from taking public transportation. The MTA has compared its proposal to similar congestion pricing initiatives in London, Stockholm, and Singapore. Those initiatives are not equitable in the least and do not impact residents in the same way. For for example, the London system has a 90% discount for those residing in the congestion zone. The Stockholm pricing is dependent on the time of day and is significantly less at US $2 and US $4 per day. This is signed Battery Park City Residents Against Congestion Tolling. Amalia Mar Makarovskaya, Mira Arbaugh. Please Arbaugh. don't read the names. We take, we'll take your word for okay. the number. All right, and also I do want to address that you stated the way to make comments um, is actually incorrect. Based on the NEPA document, 
on page 27, the proper way to form comments on the FONSI document is to redline the document as stipulated on page 27 and to submit it to the federal government that is overviewing the FHWA document, not MTA. Thank you. Thank you. I've lived in Battery Park City my whole entire life. And I've, I was raised here and I've heard from so many families so many families that are so concerned for many reasons and i want to speak up because i love this neighborhood and i've i i really feel strongly that we need to have the people that are involved with this congestion pricing reevaluate how it'll affect our neighborhood which is so distinctly affected by this plan thank you very much i'm also a battery park city resident as is the chair of cb1 CB1 has already passed a resolution asking for an exemption. Uh, so those things have been done in the past. But this is a separate process that I understood that we have to do and I wanted to make sure and I'm so grateful. Yeah, Thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to help my neighbors. 150 of us put this on public record. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, now that it's become such an interesting topic, let's have Eric, then Tammy, then Justine. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, You're on committee. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I don't support congestion pricing. This is going to impact us negatively um, financially. People are going to say, why am I coming to Manhattan? And then, of course, to the, to the residents, you're, you're, you're taxing us to go in and out of, out of this small district of, of the CBD. We already have tolls on our bridges. We've got traffic cameras every everywhere. The, the parking fines. This is this is another tax. There'll never be enough money for the MTA. So keep that in mind. And the, whatever the tolls are, it's it's only going to increase through time. So I, I just hope yes it was passed in 2019. But that doesn't mean the law can, um, it still means the law can be changed. So um, I just, I, I hope it doesn't pass. I mean, I hope it, something happens along the way that prevents it be, from being implemented. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, then Tammy, then Justine. Let Justine go before me. Sure. Okay, thanks, Tammy. Um, first of all, I agree with Eric. Um, I also agree with what Elizabeth said and her 150 people who are residents. And I just would say that, you know, I appreciate all the intricacies that, that she pointed out that are specific to Battery Park City. But at the end of the day, I also think that the congestion pricing, anybody who's in the congestion pricing zone as a resident should also get an exemption. Um, for different reasons, as well as some of the specific reasons pointed out. Um, what is not clear to me, and, and I don't know that you have the answer because it hasn't been, it hasn't been answered. In Battery Park City, if I were cho cho choosing to drive from West Street to Liberty Street and just park the car or, or leave the car there, never leave Battery Park City, would that incur a charge? I think the answer is yes. We have not. Where the gantries are, but it potentially yes. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I think that that means that every time anybody who's parking on the street is doing um, uh, alternate side of the street parking move movements, you're getting a, a charge every time you have to move the car. To they, the they've speed said speed. in the past they're going to try to work around that, but I agree that seems like a difficult task. I think it's a very difficult task. I think that it's it's it becomes so burdensome and with our stores already closing um because of whether the rent and whatever else i mean uh, i think that the burden on the mom and pop stores is going to be too great i don't know i mean i know back in 2019 i was fighting about this and people were telling me um how could we give exemptions to trucks you know, we don't want the trucks coming in how can we give exemptions to trucks to deliver? How can we give small businesses exemptions? I don't know. I think that congestion pricing is not the way to stop the pollution and stop the congestion. I get that the MTA wants to um, raise money. It probably needs money, but as Eric said, they're a mess. So I am 100% for no congestion pricing. If it's going to be shoved down our throats, 
I think that there needs to be an exemption for people that live in the district. In the, the seat, the, the district, I, I think that um, they have just not thought this through. And I do believe with Elizabeth, um, I, I, I heard you choking up Elizabeth and I feel the same exact way. Um, it, it's unconscionable and I don't know how I could stay here because it's going to impact even unless I can physically get myself out of this neighborhood up to 60 past 61st street physically with my own two feet or a bicycle. There's no way that I can afford to go to the doctors up there, not on a regular basis. And that is such a burden on people because if you're not physically able, you can't get there. So I, I, this whole thing is, it's just, it's wrong and it needs to be gone. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Tammy, if you'd like to go last, you can let Mitch go. This could be a never ending list of hands. Uh, obviously, I, oh, I'm sorry, the, law is the law. The law, obviously. Mitch, hang on a sec. Sure. Once Mitch goes, Betty, um, let's make sure no one else from the public wants to speak. I'd like the public to speak, but the public also needs to understand very clearly that the law was passed in 2019. So potentially what we need to, you know, not that laws can't change. We all know things like that can happen, but what we do need to do is really take a very strong look at the issues in the law that was passed to be looking for modifications. So with that note, I'll go last and Mitch, I apologize for interrupting. No. Well, Mitch, one more second. After Mitch, then it will be Kelly and and uh, Eric, Jesse. Okay. Yes. Th thank you. Uh, and uh, I want to just make like like two or three points of some things that I just read in the newspapers recently. Obviously, I agree with the previous speakers, all of them, one hundred percent. And I, I was reading a, a it was an op-ed article in the Daily News a couple of weeks ago by people run city council Susan Lee. Um, I'm not saying I'm supporting or not supporting. I'm just saying she wrote an audit uh, talking about, you know, Betty, would you like to bring comparisons to London and some of the other places? And she uh, was a, a done over the last like 10 or 20 years in London uh, with the, about the congestion pricing. And while it did show a, a tremendous reduction in privately owned vehicles uh, in, in the congestion zone, it saw an exponentially the same amount, almost the same amount of vehicles for higher vehicles because people needed to do things and get where they were going, because, you know, through that type of transportation. So the Mitch, the that's out of date information. I'm sorry. That's out of date information. Well, this just so you know. Well, that's that's what you're saying. She said that it was it was current that it, it was that that the uh, it was negligible. So. I'm not going to say that you're mis you're you're mistaken. I'm not going to say she's mistaken. I just read it about a week ago, so I just wanted to bring that up. Number two, as somebody that takes that that is forced to take public transportation, the trains to all corners of the city because of work and other uh, family necessities. You know, I could see both sides of the issue. But the fact that this is a 24 hour thing where, you know, unlike the bus lanes, where it's like 7 in the morning to 7 PM on, on most of, of the bus lanes to to have people like at 3 in the morning having to come from, you know, maybe not the best neighborhoods or even in, in the best neighborhoods to, to coming from, you know, if you live in co-op city or, you, and, you know, and, and you, you came down to visit family, you came down to see a show downtown or Throgs Neck. Or, or, or Cambria Heights or places or Riverdale where there's not like the easiest ways to get there. It's not really that safe uh, uh, for, for many people to, to be, you know, not to be picked up and driven. And, and uh, you know, I, I think that the 24 hour thing is something that definitely needs to be looked at uh, as, as something, you know, moving forward. The other thing that Susan Lee had mentioned was that because of a lot of the, especially in Chinatown, so many of the uh, workers that are low paid workers that are living in the outer boroughs and that don't work just typical nine to five shifts and, and rely on like, uh, you know, group uh, a, a transit, they would be, uh, you know, tremendously impacted. So uh, aside from that, uh, regardless of what side you're on, the 24 hour thing, I mean, like to, to charge a congestion on a Tuesday night at uh, three o'clock in the morning, is is I think is cruel for many people that uh, uh, don't have a safe situation. Thank you. 
Thank you. And then uh, if you could unmute Kelly and then Eric, Jesse. Kelly, you can unmute them. There you go. Now I'm in violent agreement with everyone here. That this is a disaster. Uh, and the unintended consequences of this, I, I feel like the state has no idea of what a make or break is this for many families. Um, two things is, I mean, we're pretty, it sounds like we're pretty unified as a community, but we're also pretty unified as, as our local, local representatives. So we should be really focused on what we can do to support their efforts to get exemptions. Uh, you know, personally, I'm for local exemptions for anyone. I think this is an absurd law. And even in the written of the law, they're trying to raise a billion dollars, which I don't, you know, it'll have unintended consequences. So it's not about congestion. This is just about a tax, right? And, you know, we've already lost hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers because of COVID who moved out because of ridiculous policies that were not well thought through. Most of them or half of them didn't even come back, right? This city is, is and the state is so disconnected. Uh, the second thing I would point out is, you know, they, they, they set the, the central business district from south of 60th Street. Um, I'm not sure that by any measure that lower Manhattan is a central business district anymore. It's primarily a residential district, right? And, it, and, the, and that's clearly the direction it's going. So how do you define central business district, right? And frankly, if uh, somebody wants to drive to Midtown from downtown, during the middle of a work day, fine, pay your, pay your toll. But that's not what this law is about, right? And we, we need to get some focus on, uh, you know, helping our uh, lo local officials and our elected officials fight this. Because because I have not, you know, I've heard from so many neighbors that just say, this is it, I'm leaving, right? And, and how we get that message across to um, our state officials who, you know, don't live here, have no idea how this neighborhood works and what's even down here. You know, I heard from an, uh, an elected official over the weekend, it's like, I can't believe that this many people live down here. It's like, yeah, it's not 1980 anymore. This is a residential neighborhood. Okay. Thank you. And thanks for, um, <clears throat> you know, thanks for all the participation and the unity on this. So. Thank you. Unless Eric, what do you have to say? Not Eric Jesse, sorry. Uh, He's an attendee. His hand is up. Yeah, give me one. I'm not seeing. Oh, yeah, I are you? Do you have mic access, Eric? Wait, Eric, I already, I, my, I already made my statement. Uh, Eric Jesse, who's in Jesse? the public area, who's a former board member. Yes, that's correct. And not Eric, you. Yeah, uh, Eric, I don't see, I don't see anything for. You're for right. I also don't see a, a red microphone. Let me see. Uh, no, I don't see anything. Now, Eric, you have to okay. connect your audio. Eric, Jesse, Eric. Yeah, Eric, Jesse, you need to connect your audio so that uh, you can speak. Perhaps he signed in twice, so he's got a phone number, but I don't know that. So if that's the case, text somebody. Well, in the meantime, Ishma, if you'd like to speak. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I'm a Tribeca resident, so I, I just wanted to address some of the comments around the congestion isn't for, because we're all residential. Um, I live right by the Holland Tunnel, and I face significant amount of congestion every day as people cross from Brooklyn and Queens and honk the horn like crazy to go into the Holland Tunnel because they don't want to pay a toll by using the other boroughs. So there is a reason we're having the congestion pricing to cut down on the thoroughfare of Manhattan from going from one side to the other. So I think that is a good thing. And I do want people to recognize that there are parts of lower Manhattan that have significant congestion. 
um, and do impede quality of life, especially if you live in North Tribeca in terms of air pollution, noise pollution, very unsafe to cross the streets because of road rage. And I would recommend anyone who wants to come and hang out from Wednesday through Sunday night after 3 p.m. through 9 p.m. You can hang out at Bubby's and you will see the road rage that is going on. Um, however, the flip point to that is I do think if you are living downtown and you have a car and you're using it to leave the city, which is what I normally go do, I'm being penalized for that. So I'm being penalized um, for using the car to leave the city and not add to the congestion, right? And then come right back into the city um, because I live here. And so I do support some type of ejection, exemption for lower Manhattan residents who are not driving around. Right, but going in, but there is a reason for some congestion based pricing. So I do want people, I think we all have to look at all both sides of the issues. It's not like totally crazy. Thank you. And you definitely have other, there are people who are supporters of congestion pricing. So they just tend to not get involved in these because why? It's already a law. Tammy, if you'd like to speak. I still don't see that Eric just he has it's a not Eric. Uh, hey. Eric. Oh, Hi. there he is. There I am. Dr. K, good evening. And uh, um, members of the committee, good evening. So I'd like to make three quick points with respect to congestion pricing. Um, first and foremost, I think the notion of congestion pricing works. I think the devil's in the details. I think there, there are three things we should keep in mind as we think about how it affects BPC and the general lower Manhattan area. First, and this is more broad, but we should consider, and I, this is a little prosaic, but some freedom of movement. I don't think it's fair that we should be twisting ourselves into nut into pretzels as to whether or not we can go out of our houses at 4 a.m. in the morning or 2 p.m. at night in the afternoon, or whether or not particular trips are being preferenced versus one or versus the other. As residents of both Lower Manhattan, as residents of Manhattan, as residents of New York, and dare I say, as residents of America, we should be able to come and go as we please. And this law here just smacks of containment that is really wouldn't be tolerated, frankly, anywhere else. That's the first point. The second point is with respect to the examples that are used to say why congestion pricing works, primarily London, which is a great example. But I will note that in London, there's a residential exemption of 90% of the congestion pricing toll. So whether we get all of our cake, which is complete exemption, or at least a partial exemption like they do in London, it is clear that in places where these types of laws have gone into effect, they have made efforts to take care of the uh, current residents of the residents in that zone. And then the third piece of it is something that we should all consider and should all think through. The MTA is a collective use. We all ride the subways, residents, tourists, business folks, commuters from Jersey, so on and so forth. Two numbers. The New York State just passed budget was $229 billion. The New York State, New York City just passed budget was $102 billion. Of those two numbers, we're being asked to deal with congestion pricing to raise $1 billion. I dare I say a rounding error. If it's so important, and I think it is, to fund the MTA because we all use it, then this particular funding should come from all of us. Building it on the back of residents of Lower Manhattan, to me, just smacks of unfairness and it's unequal and inequitable. So to the extent we have congestion pricing, fine. Let's come to a way in which residents here in Lower Manhattan aren't made to bear the brunt of congestion pricing to fund the MTA, which is used not just by us, but all folks in the city and visitors to the city as well. Thanks for taking the time and letting me speak. Thank you, Eric, very eloquently said. And Elizabeth, is your hand still up? Because we've heard from you once. Uh, yes, Elizabeth wants to make another statement. Okay, she'd make it oh. and keep it quick, a minute or less, please. Elizabeth, you can go ahead. You may unmute. There we go. Sorry, I just, I also wanted to, I also wanted to flag that our community, we're, we're not meaning that we want to be exclusive as Battery Park City residents. It's just that we have precedence and standing as a community that is not, has never been considered New York City. It has always been considered a separate state governed entity, right? The authority runs what happens in Battery Park City. So, and, and, and 
I feel very strongly that we've helped to also develop, you know, the, the infrastructure and the thoroughfares in lower Manhattan and we continue to. Our, our, our revenue continues to, you know, maintain the, the esplanade and all these non um, congestion, you know, areas. And so I just, I feel strongly, I don't want other people outside of Battery Park City to think that we are some kind of exclusive um, neighborhood that is just interested in ourselves. No, we actually have standing to really ask the DOT and the, and the Federal Highway Commission to really re reevaluate what they're saying, because a lot of the things that they're passing in this proposal are false assumptions. And we are a great example and a use case that can be the tipping point to really make them do further due diligence for all residents. That's all I want to say. I don't want to thank you. And the DOT has nothing to do with this. So. No, they are, part of, the, they are part of the authors of the FONSI. They, they're, there's multiple agencies involved with the document that we they, have. Yes, to... they all contributed information. So if you would like to, but they have nothing to do with the law and they have nothing to do with the implementation of, of the tolling. It, 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 uh, from what I understand from reading the document, they do. So um, there are multiple, uh, and, I, and we say that in our statement, who we're addressing this to, all of those entities are accountable to help do the diligence. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eric, if you can keep it very brief, because then please let Tammy speak. Yeah, sure, very, very brief. Um, can, can we have a, a rezo on, on congestion pricing? I know there was one a few years ago, but um, to, to take what everyone is saying or, or this consensus of, the com of this committee on how strongly we're against many aspects of congestion pricing. Eric, I'd suggest before Betty answers that, that everyone needs to take a look at where we've stood already and what we've said. The time that um, we can't do a resolution tonight. No, of course. Because it, because it has not been an agenda item. And not being an agenda item would preclude it from, it wouldn't be, I don't think that'd be fair to do to the public who who may have wanted to have commented and be involved in the conversation and were not necessarily. So it is something that we can do. We won't unfortunately have the time to do a red line document for the June 12th deadline, but we do have opportunities to opine to the state and to the control board, mobility control board to about what we think should be exemptions and other things. I mean, we can, the law has passed, and as I said, I, we can work with all of our electeds. I haven't heard one elected that I know of say to turn the law backwards um, versus to try and mitigate. For me personally, if they give placards an exemption, I think the public should sue because the placards already get free parking on the backs of the public realm. There's no reason that they should get that kind of a, a valued benefit and the rest of us all have to pay for it. So I think there are many, 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 many things that we need to talk about for the next steps with this. But I don't think to, one, definitely not tonight because we haven't given the public the due diligence of putting it on an agenda to have a discussion. Secondly, even if we put it on for executive committee this month, we would miss that June 12th deadline. So we are encouraging individuals who would like to respond to the June 12th deadline to the federal government has put out to definitely do so. And we will take it up in the next stop in the process. Can I just say something to Tammy, Betty? Quickly, not, I'm not gonna, it's not a, not a discussion. One thing, th there are electeds in the, outer, in the suburbs and the outer boroughs that will be bringing lawsuits. So that's just the one thing I wanted to uh, respond, Tammy, to what you yes. had said. Mitch, I said our electeds. Okay, thank you. Uh, CB1 electeds. I got it, thank you, thank you. Ben, uh, Eric, you good with that? Eddie, you yeah, good with that? yeah. Tammy, I, did you still I, want to I, I just wanted to go on record that, that that we're not happy with the way things are, even if it's after the, the June 12th, just to go on record that we're not happy. Yeah. That, yeah, we have to take a look at that and we'll be building off of what we've already done. 
There's a general person. Oh, there is a person in the public whose hand was up. The one who um, disappeared before. Eric disappeared uh, before or somebody else. I don't know. There's yeah, this, is some, this is somebody new, but anyway, if yes, but this is absolutely the last. This is absolutely. And they better say something new, nothing that's been already said, please. Uh, go ahead, Polly. Uh, whoever's on the phone, I just unmuted you. You can go ahead, you may speak. We cannot hear you. Onez, try promoting them to be a uh, participant uh, attendee. Uh, yeah, you should promote them to come this one. Uh, can you unmute? Give them the direction, it's star what? Star six. Star six. Star six to unmute. On the phone. They unmuted just now, we just couldn't hear. Okay, well, let's move on. This is, we're over three hours into this uh, and we're not gonna be taking any actions at this time. Um, if they'd like to write something to the office and you can send it on to me, that would be appreciated. If they would, if they want any input on how they can act individually, also send them that. Okay, keep going. We were beyond this, luckily. Alternatives, yes. In terms of people who love to keep referring to London, London really cannot be compared to our system. In fact, London Mayor, because it's the city of London and there is the greater London area. Most people think of London as the greater area. London City is only one square mile, so it's very much like our district. It's the original historic London and it's called City of London. But they, he has called for the introduction of pay per mile driving charges in the UK capital with a daily fee of two pounds, about $2.70. And that would be for the cleanest of vehicles. So they have le levels, they have multiple charging schemes going on. One of them will be pay per mile, as well as the congestion toll, as well as the, the cleanliness. So if you're ultra clean or well, you'll get to see that. In January 22, they found that 27 percent, if you go back, uh, reduction in car traffic is needed by 2030 and they are not on target at all to meet that. So they need to continually change the program in London. The road pricing proposal they're hoping will help them do that. They have removed all free parking. That was one thing to make cars less desirable. They have put in more uh, road, they've blocked up roadways, they've put in more protected bike lanes. They've done a lot of things to make car driving as unpleasant as possible. So again, with the ultra low emission zone, they're hoping to expand that out into the suburbs, which is yet another way of another fee that has to be paid as well as the miles. Next, so people can feel better about it. And also because there's been some, there is talk besides electric, which does not work terribly well for larger vehicles to let you know that they, they are still looking at hydrogen fuel cells uh, for the bigger vehicles, not for cars. Ford is testing in the UK. So we'll hope to hear more from this as it goes on. Next. There may be some switching from electric. Another announcement, Uber has started something for teens, for those who are looking for ways for their children to be able to take rides on their own. It is linked to a parent or a caregiver's uh, account, has to be. But nevertheless, they now will allow children and teens to travel on their own. So if you're interested, look at, look at Uber. Betty, we can't be promoting a particular company's 
policy, especially when it comes to kids? I mean, I I know you're sharing just general updates, but mm, I'm I'm a little endorse it. comfortable. Yeah, no, I, well, I in no way endorse it, but it's changes that are happening, and I hope we look at city bike for that too, because right now you have to be 18 to use city bike, and should high school children be able to use it? Okay. Um. So consider from that perspective, moving next, because we've always thought about only adults with all these transportation issues. Uh, New York City DOT Division of Bridges made an announcement, which CB1 did as well, for the Battery Park Tunnel underpass. The drainage system starting today, Monday through Fridays, overnight, 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. Only one tunnel will be open at a time. So be aware of that. Uh, for those who've been writing to me asking about Sammy's law, yes, unfortunately, it seems to be held. It got dumped from the budget in the first place. It appears to be held up at the assembly where uh, assembly person Hasty, Hasty, that's Steve who runs that, is a speaker, will refuses to bring it up for a vote. So that's going on right now with a uh, hunger strike. So we'll see what happens. If anything happens before the assembly breaks for the year. For those who like contests by the DOT, this was kind of cute for picking a name, but this is in fact a cargo bike. It is a pedal assist, which is the only kind the city uses versus throttle bikes. You will notice it has four wheels. Bicycle definition by New York state law is two wheels. This was authorized and allowed because it is a pilot program. So it'll be interesting to look as we move forward. If you go to the next one, there are people who are real fans of some of the humor that has been used on Twitter. And in fact, Nick, well, Nick Benson stepped forward and acknowledged it's his and thanked this fan club here. So for those who want to know, it is now called Cardi B. And here's a back view for those of you who ride in bike lanes and are concerned about width. It is 36 inches wide, but yes, it does take up the whole bike lane. And that is an issue we've dealt with in the past and will continue to with how do people pass within bike lanes and how do things work? But very interesting that for bike repairs and things, they're going to be using a pedal bike. Yes. I want to be respectful of what you said before and about timing. Are all of these timely updates that um, we need to do tonight, or do you want to hold some of them? I will for hold all of them, but I just want to mention that DCAS is doing the same thing. So if you see them around the neighborhood and they have been some, please take a shot and send it to me. Thanks. And I will suspend everything else because there have been way too many conversations about others. So the only other thing is to understand for the public what a pilot program means and what their feedback is. So if you can close that topic of the pilot programs they're running um, and whether or not they're getting public comment, that would be great. Well, if Kate would like to take that on, there was no definition other than it's a pilot program and generally they do take some kind of, in, they give some output and take some comments at the end. But I have no idea when the pilot project would end if Kate happens to know. I would have to check on that, Betty. Yeah. Then I'll get back to people in the committee at least and let you know, and as well as you, Tammy. Uh, there was nothing published about that that I could find. So I thank you. I really like to hear the rest of the announcements just to keep up to date. Well, I can send you. I can send you some of the slide packs so you can look at that. So I'll do that. What I wanted to do was, if there's a moment or two. One, I'd like to close the meeting because it's certainly long enough and go off camera. With that off camera, I'd like to have, I think there's the two new people, if they would introduce or the people in the committee would introduce themselves to them as well. But I don't want to do it on film and I'm put it on YouTube. So here's what we do. So um, I'll leave it to a recording. Yes, please. Uh, wait, motion to adjourn. Okay. That's my second. So, <laughs> which you don't need in committees. I just went to it. With of that, let's say thank you to the public for opining and for coming. And then what you want to do is stop the recording because we are no longer having a public meeting. And then um, the attendees can say good night, can go away as well. So it becomes an interesting. Yes, 
there you go. Thank you, attendees.